Hello everybody, this is Chris Osborne uh, with First Indiana Robotics. I am the program director and uh, I guess your MC for this evening. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of great content for you this evening. We've got uh, an opening session here in a moment with uh, Monica and Casey uh, to talk about self-care during self-isolation. We're going to meet our uh, 2020 uh, rookies. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, tipping points for teams going from surviving to just thriving and uh, some other good content and a, a good interview this evening to wrap things up uh, with one of our student board of directors uh, interviewing a, a first senior mentor and a systems engineer for Walt Disney World Parks and Resort, uh, Andy Maluzzi. So well, let's get things kicked off. I'm gonna hand things over to Casey uh, and Monica to talk a little bit about self-care. Uh, so guys, take, take it over. All right, can you see us? Yes, we can. All right. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Monica Bravo. I'm an event intern for First Indiana Robotics. Um, I've been working in Columbus, Ohio as a preschool teacher. And for the past five years, I've been a mental health advocate. And this is my roommate, Casey. Hello, um, I am currently working on my master's in social work. Um, I have been a mental health advocate in Columbus, Ohio for about five years as well. Uh, I really focus on suicide prevention and just spreading mental health education because there's a huge stigma surrounding mental health. And I think it's important um, that it's something we talk about. So for the past, seven days, six, yeah. seven days, Ohio has had a stay at home order. So we have been in our house cooped up <laughs> with our dog. Um, so we just came up with some, some tips and tricks that might help, that have helped us out and might help you guys out, uh, just trying to stay safe and taking care of yourselves as best as you can um, during this time. Yeah, so one of the biggest things we noticed right off the bat that could really help is opening your blinds, letting in natural light, even if you know it's not sunny because we're hitting that real dreary spring weather. And I don't know how rainy it is over in Indiana, but it's been not too bad over here. Um, but if it is nice out and it's not too cold, you can even open your windows, get a nice breeze coming through, some fresh air, just kind of air your place out. Um, it'll help you feel a little less isolated, um, a little more connected to the outside world, which is something that I think we could all use right now as we're kind of navigating this really turbulent time. And then as going with the whole not feeling isolated theme, um, we wanted to stress the importance of not working from your bed. Instead, getting out of bed. I know it's really tempting to just sleep in, stay in bed, sit your laptop down on your lap. Um, but getting out of bed is going to help you both physically because you're not straining your back and your neck and mentally because you're putting yourself in a different physical space will also help you put yourself in a different mental space. Um, so you want to keep your bed as a, as a space that you sleep in. Yeah. So that'll help you sleep better at night. And then it will also help you be more focused and productive throughout the day. Um, so just moving throughout your house in general will help, uh, but especially getting out of bed. So working in the living room, working in the dining room. Even if it's nice out, you can work outside, um, you know, change it up. Sometimes maybe you sit on the floor, do some work on the floor. Sometimes I like to do that. I don't know, maybe I'm just weird. <laughs> um, another thing that really helps is trying to stick to a schedule. Um, especially right now, it may feel like you don't really have a schedule and you don't really feel like you need to stick to one, but it can help you if you keep a consistent day-to-day -day like you would as if, as if you were going to work, as if you were going to school. So get up at the same time that you would maybe, unless it's like super duper early and then maybe, you know, let yourself sleep in a little bit. Um, but, you know, get up, try and start your day at the same time. Um, try to set a schedule like we have made. Yeah, it's, well, it's going to be backwards, but we keep it on the whiteboard so that we can keep ourselves accountable. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite things that I've started to do is try to start my day with breakfast, which I usually don't do during like when I'm going to work because I'm always late and I like to rush out the door. But since I'm home, I have time, I can come downstairs, make myself breakfast and start my day that way. Um, it'll really help power you through the day and feel less stagnant. Um, it just, it helps you keep yourself accountable throughout the day too. So you don't feel like you're constantly sitting either on your phone, doing work, watching Netflix, it'll help you get up um, and do something new. 
So like an example, if I get up at like nine and have breakfast, I let myself do schoolwork from like 9.30 to noon, but every hour or so, get up, walk around your house, take a lap, um, go outside if it's nice. Um, even just stand up and like stretch your legs just to keep blood flowing so you don't feel so stuck because we're all kind of feeling a little bit stuck right now. So anything to kind of normalize movement throughout your day helps. Um, and then another thing I really wanted to point out is this is not a time where you really need to, you know, do something huge to change your life. A lot of people feel like, well, I'm at home, so I might as well, you know, clean the entire house and keep everything perfect and start this new project and do all of these style, like goals that I've set for myself. But it's okay for you to feel anxious and scared and confused because of everything that's happening. Like it is a global pandemic. We're all anxious and scared and confused and we don't know when things are gonna change on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but if you, you know, at least set the goal for yourself, like a really small goal every day of like, I wanna get out of bed today. I wanna eat a new meal today. Um, it'll really help you feel like you're at least doing something, which doing something is better than doing nothing. Yes. Uh, and along with those like very small goals, something that we've heard from our friends and we've experienced, some people have, have talked to us about the problem of overeating. Like, you know, we've all seen those memes that are like, I took 17 naps and ate 23 snacks today. Um, some people are, are seeing a problem with overeating as in eat, snacking too much throughout the day. And just because of who we are as people, we keep forgetting to eat all of our food. Um, so one of the things that we make sure that we do and put on our schedule is set meal times. So at 9 a.m., we have breakfast. At From noon to one, we have lunch. and We have a dedicated time to eat, and we try not to eat outside of that time. Um, and then while we have that dedicated hour, half an hour, 45 minutes, whatever you allow yourself, making sure that we are using that time as a break from our work and as, as a dedicated eating time. So instead of sitting in front of our computer and getting work done, which is what some of us might be tempted to do, just allowing ourselves to have a mental break, talking to a friend over text or having a FaceTime date with someone, something that will just let you take a breather and relax and not be stressed from everything going on around you. Yes, I know I'm always guilty of like, I like to just sit at my desk and eat when I'm at work, but it's nice to get up, change the scenery. It's a good uh, chance for you to stretch your legs again um, and just, you know, try something to change it up so that you don't feel like you're again, sitting in the same spot and like you're isolated where you are all the time. Um, Something that a lot of people have been talking about is like exercise. Like this is a great time to start my great weight loss journey. It doesn't have to be that, but it is important to stretch your body and to get up and move just to keep blood flow going. Um, it'll help you clear your mind to take a walk, you know, get up and, <laughs> sorry, my dog's jumping on it. Um, get up, take a walk, go outside. If it's not nice, you know, just kind of take a lap around your house. If you have a dog, take your dog for a walk. Um, just getting out, going, um, look up stretching videos on YouTube. We've been doing, or at least trying to do at least 30 minutes of stretching a day or taking the dog for a 45 minute walk if we don't do that. Um, there's a lot of really easy things you can do just to you know, get that movement for yourself. It's good for your mind, it's good for your body. Um, and those things will help you feel a little less stressed during this strange time. That will also like help you break up your day. I don't maybe I've experienced this. I don't know how much other people have experienced it, but my days just seem to like really drag on. Um, and if you're just doing the same thing for 10, 11 hours straight, you, you don't feel like accomplished is accomplished the right word. Yeah. You might not feel accomplished or you might not feel like the day was productive in any way. So just having those short 30, 45 minute breaks of, of getting your body moving will help you out a lot. <laughs> Um, and then a lot of things that at least I've been receiving a lot of emails about this lately is like, if you are at home and you don't really have school work to do and you don't really have work work to do and you just feel like, well, I want to be helping in some way, but I don't know how, um, try to find a way that you can help remotely. Uh, there's a lot of, especially with the schools being out right now, um, a lot of them are looking for people who are willing to do like 
you know, reading and like taking a video of it or reading on Facebook live for kids. Or if you have family members that have young kids that like to have books read to them. And I'm sure those family members would love a break in time from, in, you know, entertaining their kids constantly. See if you can FaceTime in and read a book to the kids, or if you can, you know, do an activity, make some, I don't know, putty or slime. Yeah. <laughs> Draw with them, like do stuff like that. Uh, if you just look up like your local school district on Facebook or their website, I'm sure there's some way you can help in one way or another. Um, we, we work in a preschool and we were talking about for my classroom, some of the things that we were doing to help our kids out is um, Casey and I have been uh, doing a fun little session called Miss Casey and Miss Monica, <laughs> where one of us teaches the other one how to do something. And that has just been uh, working on a uh, that has been helping our kids work on their skills and giving parents a break. Um. And it's not just for kids, but you can find virtual activities for yourself if you're just sitting there and you're bored. Uh, there are plenty of landmarks around the world that are doing like virtual tours. So you can go, you know, see the Great Wall of China or the pyramids, stuff like that, where, um, you know, it's kind of weird to do it virtually, but maybe it'll spark your interest and you can start planning a future trip for when everything opens back up and, you know, all of that. Yeah. For me personally, it helps to like plan for the future. I'm a pretty anxious person anyway, and I like to plan. So it's great to have some ideas of what you might want to do in the future. It can help you be in a more positive mindset. Yes. And the last thing that I really wanted to emphasize before we ask about questions and take your questions um, is just that this does not have to be a time where you get everything done. You're constantly doing something. It's okay to take breaks. It's okay to feel anxious. Um, my biggest life motto is it's okay okay to not be okay. Um, so, you know, check in on your friends, check in on your family. It may not feel like a lot, but just sending, you know, a text to being like, hey, what's up? Just sending a meme without, you know, you have to, yeah, you don't have to say anything without context, just sending it to someone. It could mean a lot more to them than you think. Um, especially like if you have family that you can't see right now and you might, they might feel really distanced and isolated. So don't be afraid to, you know, shoot a message to that person that you never really talked to, but you're like, well, I hope they're doing okay. I haven't seen them in a while like reach out. I'm sure they'll really appreciate it. Um, Chris said that there's a couple of questions. Chris, do we have any questions? Yeah, we've got uh, two. I'll, I'll just ask them both and then you guys can handle them. And we've got just a few minutes left. Uh, so one is, uh, do you feel like working a bit less now that you're working from home, perhaps having smaller work goals instead of trying to fill up eight hours now that you don't have to travel? And then the second one would be, how do you manage distractions uh, like dogs hint hint and <laughs> and and for folks at home with their kids how do you manage those distractions um go, go ahead <laughs> so as far as setting work goals what we've done because we both were in a pretty unique situation going into this where um we kind of right before our work from home order we kind of got thrown into here are our 95 families that are preschool. You two are in charge of finding all of the resources and helping them out. Also, we're closing tomorrow, so good luck. Yeah. <laughs> um, we quickly became very overwhelmed with trying to do eight hours of work a day. Eight hours turned into 12 hours of work a day, and we just found ourselves really overwhelmed. So we switched our mindset to what the to having a very strict schedule of we work on school work in the morning and then we work on work work in the afternoon from mm -hmm. these hours that is when I'm working I am in the office from this hour to this hour yes um and then having short simple goals that we can do yes. so instead of saying Casey we need to find 17 like resources for all of our families and make websites for all of them we said all right Casey you would need to accomplish two things today do you want to do the websites today or do you want to order all of the stuff today yeah um, so things like that. It's like setting boundaries for yourself is just as important as setting boundaries for other people like within yourself. Um, and so like kind of like the distractions thing, it can be very difficult. I can understand because my dog's kind of being annoying right now <laughs> um, to find time away from other people if that's what you're trying to do or away from kids. Um, try to have a space that is dedicated to just you but try to keep that away from your bed, um, you know, at your desk and try to like, if you make block, if you block out time, it can be a little bit easier to say, hey, from this time, this is what I'm doing and here's an activity for you. Or if you know that your dog likes to nap from, you know, 
noon to two, maybe that becomes your productive time. Um, so it's kind of like, it can be kind of hard to balance that with what's going on around you. But if you can figure out the schedules of the people around you, it might, you know. So again, it goes like back to that scheduling. Like mm -hmm. we kind of, like I personally like kind of felt guilty because I was like, we're home all day. We can play with Evie all day. And then I was like, I still have to get work done. So we were like, okay, well we can't play with her all day, but between three and 3.45, we have a dedicated dog time. Mm -hmm. And then like that, that kind of helped ease that guilt. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's a, a lot of good information. And uh, there were a few other questions I could share with you guys. And we could certainly put out some resources. Uh, if you could think of some resources, maybe email them uh, to us. Uh, we can get them on our website for teams. We have a, a special page right now that are remote resources for teams. Uh, and again, thank you so much. Self-care is so important. Uh, and yes. and I, I really do like the, the tip to just uh, reach out. Um, either maybe just go down your one of your social media channels and find somebody maybe you haven't talked to in a while and just say hi, right? Yeah. yeah. Huh. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, Monica. Uh, yeah. Have a good evening. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to be tra yeah we're going to be transitioning now to our our next topic. We've got um, the uh, 2020 rookies um, from this year. Uh, we're excited to introduce everybody to our rookies. We had three rookie teams this year and I'm going to share my screen for everybody here in a moment. Uh, first up, we're going to meet uh, team 8103. Uh, that'd be the um, uh, Braden. Braden Julian is with us from uh, team 8103 from East Noble High School. You guys are night night robotics yes yep very good so uh brayden i'm going to share a, a powerpoint presentation i've got some pictures uh and uh we're going to each team's going to take about 10 or 15 minutes if you guys if you just want to kind of generally talk to us a little bit about uh your experience uh, that you guys had this year uh joining the first community and um Anything maybe from your rookie quick build? Uh, uh, you guys did get to go to one district competition. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, if you want to talk a little bit about that, uh, take it away. And then I'm sure we'll have some questions. Okay. Hey, thank you so much, Chris. Um, I think it's really cool that First Robotics reached out to the rookie teams and is doing this. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, my name is Braden Julian. I'm one of the mentors from East Noble High School, um, Team 8103. Um, learned a lot this year uh, going into this whole first experience. Uh, we got started by uh, being approached by Bosch um, in Albion, which is uh, not too far from Kindleville, about 10 minute drive. And they reached out and said, hey, they had some first alum. So let's go ahead. We'd really like to start a team in this area. So they reached out to all the high schools in the area and uh, East Noble jumped at the chance to kind of be a leader and trying to kind of uh, just lead our community um, and getting a first team. Um, so we met with some Bosch engineers who uh, gave us a lot of support and kind of gave us some direction on where to start. And that's kind of how this whole uh, adventure started. So we worked closely with Bosch to uh, get, secure some funding kind of figure out what was always going on. Um, the other mentor kind of uh, talked me into helping and I'm really glad he did. Uh, I've been a science Olympiad coach in the past. Uh, so I thought I, eh, it's, it's similar and it was not similar to um, science Olympiad in really any way. Um, I was used to, you know, science competitions, but this was, a whole new beast, which I thought was, which was kind of overwhelming at first, um, but at the same time was a really, really good experience. Um, just with all of the sponsorship, um, the marketing of your team, raising funds, designing the robot. I mean, there's just so many facets um, to uh, first that it, it was overwhelming, but at the same time it was super cool and I'm really glad um, we were able to at least go to one district uh, competition. So um, 
I was helping out with after school practices and the other mentor was helping out in classes or uh, with or in class, excuse me. And um, we started off because we didn't really know what we were getting ourselves into. We started with a VEX competition. So we had our kids um, build, design um, and build VEX robots to complete a task. And they did fairly well at that, kind of gave them a tight timeline, had to work things up in CAD, um, things of that nature. And they did uh, fairly well. And then once we got the rules, we started looking over the rules and got deep into what this competition was about and tried to throw a robot together. Um, this picture is actually, or the pictures are actually kind of cool. Our superintendent actually came um, to uh, see our, our district competition in Bloomington, which was a super cool experience. Um, we, we've had a lot of really great support from our community. And we're looking forward to next season, kind of seeing what we can do um, with another season. Um, super uh, cool experience. Well, I, yeah, that's I, so. I def, definitely have um, some questions for you. So, sure. uh, and I'm just going to kind of continue to flick through some of these pictures. Um, so, mm -hmm. one of the questions that I had um, prepped you for earlier um, was that. Uh, what was a moment that really made you proud of this team this year? Was there something that it could be during build or competition? Was there a moment that you just were really excited and proud of the kids? Uh, yeah, there was, there was actually a couple moments. Um, one of the most, most of them happened actually at that first di uh, district competition. Um, when we uh, got to check in, um, I would say Chris knows this well, we were, rookie team and we kind of were, were a mess uh, trying to kind of get things uh, together and get things organized and our kids they stepped up in a great way we got help uh, from a veteran team um, they helped us out and it was that was huge so our kids really kind of stepped up um, when it counted most and I was proud of that um, something else I was proud of and this was even before the competition is these kids this is our students robot. Um, they put in all the time. We, uh, the mentors and even the uh, engineers who were helping had very little contact with this robot. Um, this was all the kids um, looked at times. It was looked a little rough. Uh, they had to try to clean some stuff up, but this is all, was all the kids and uh, myself, the other mentor, um, at East Noble, we were just thrilled with what our kids came up with and the fact that, you know, they really uh, did this themselves. And for being a rookie team, I, I we were proud of what uh, we were able to put together um, our first season. It may not have always been pretty, um, but I, I liked how we kind of came through. And then finally, uh, the last thing was at the district uh, competition in Bloomington. Um, we were able to get the um, rookie award, rookie inspiration award, um, and we were uh, honored to be able to uh, receive that award um, from first, and we really appreciated it. Um, it just shows, you know, our, our, ki our students, our kids' work paid off, um, and I think they were pretty excited about that, too, so. Well, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, you, uh, I know you guys worked hard, and um, was there... Uh, one question I, I like to ask our, our rookies is that now you've kind of been through it. Uh, is there something yeah. you wish you would have known or is there something you learned that, Oh, that would have been nice. So, Cause it's, it's a lot. It's not just, uh, it's it not is. like taking on any other kind of thing. And so there's a, there, I always tell folks there's about 1500 moving pieces. What was one of those pieces that you guys kind of figured out later? Um, like you said, there is a lot of, uh, little pieces um it wasn't a i can't really pick out one specific thing major thing but just little things like um how to better market yourself how to um you know uh, like buttons we didn't get around to making buttons um uh oh
All right, we've lost audio. We're going to try to fix our audio here in a second. So hopefully uh, you guys can hear me. And uh, if we can get audio back, um, what we'll probably do is see if we can't get one of our other rookie uh, folks on board. Uh, it looks like we've got Jennifer from team 8116. Um, uh, Jennifer, if you want to unmute, um, and uh, oh yeah, so Braden, you're you're back. So am I back? Okay. Yeah. So anyway, Sorry. just real quick. No, that's okay. Maybe just one last thing to to wrap up. We'll move on to to eighty one sixteen. Any last thoughts to uh, folks out there, the community? I would say, I would say we just uh, we're thankful for the first community, all their support. It is truly amazing community and. We were always told that, um, but it really showed. So thank you to everybody um, at first, especially the veteran teams. Um, shout out to uh, Red Alert, who helped us out big time at the Bloomington District Competition. Um, so just thank you. We're looking forward to next year. Awesome. Well, fantastic. Thanks for joining us, and thanks for the pictures. Yeah, uh, and and you. congratulations on Rookie Inspiration, and uh, we'll, yeah. we'll uh, keep moving forward. So, so with that, you. yeah, with that, we're going to move on to FRC 8116 Hatchet Robotics from Washington, Indiana. Uh, there's several Washington high schools in the state. Uh, this one is mm -hmm. in the actual city of Washington. Uh, so, Jennifer, we've got a couple of students, uh, Alex and Paige there. You guys want to tell us a little bit about uh, the team and what I'll do is I'll just kind of rotate through the pictures for you on the screen. Sure. Uh, well, like I said, we're from Southern Indiana. So there's not a whole lot around us, um, but we kind of got started. We had one English teacher who had done it something similar in the past. I think it was Vex. And she went to our computer science teacher and got him started. And I was kind of the third teacher to join, but I'm really glad I did. Uh, we've got two students with us today. We've got Alex Chestnut and Paige Bird. Uh, they're both oh, our wow. freshmen. <laughs> and they have really taken over the leadership role uh, in their own departments and sections. And they've really stepped up. We love our seniors, but our freshmen really get us excited because hopefully we're going to keep them for four years. Um, we were lucky enough to uh, work, I like to say work hard enough to uh, earn the rookie all-star and the top seeded at the Bloomington competition, which was really neat experience. Um, but I think probably for me and the kids are gonna tell you their own, but for me, the most exciting part was when the robot fell apart and watch, sorry if I stole yours guys, when they had to rush back and kind of put the thing back together last second, just kind of watching them all of a sudden just get it and really work together as a team. That was really exciting to see. Um, so I'll let Alex, if you want to go ahead and. No, well, I think my favorite part was just being able to be around a bunch of my friends and work on this really fun thing. And seeing it out there on the field, doing the stuff, I was like, yes, we finally did it. Finally got it done and it was working. And then when it fell apart, I was like, oh, my gosh. And then we went back to the pits and fixed it. It was just crazy. It was so fun. Did we lose Paige? No, we got no, Paige. I'm here. Okay. I don't, I don't know how to. We're okay. <laughs> That's okay. We can hear you. So uh, do you have any oh, things okay. to share about your season, about maybe a, a favorite moment or so, a moment um, during the season that really made I you? I think my favorite moment was probably like we worked on a Saturday and then we that's when we actually got the robot to like drive. I thought it was really cool because we actually got it to work after like all that hard work. It finally started like that was exciting. actually doing what it was supposed to do. <laughs> Not so exciting when it ran into the door. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's good. Is there, um, uh, is there something that you guys think you're going to do next year uh, that you learned about this year as, as having gone through the experience that might help you get better or just maybe it's something different? Maybe you, you didn't do something this year. Uh, Braden had mentioned the buttons and it, there's so many different things that you can't do at all. But is there something maybe you guys would like to add on for next year or do differently? 
Well, one thing that we are the mentors and I were kind of talking about, we took the entire group up and did that reveal day. Um, and our group is quite large. It's not the largest by any means out there, but then we came back when everybody's tired and they all go back. And then it's, you know, a couple of weeks before you're really getting going on that robot. And we're thinking next year, instead of taking the whole group, we're just going to take a small group up and let the rest of the group stay back with the rest of the mentors. And that way, once we get the reveal, they can start rocking and rolling and going on it and do that big meeting um, that some of the other groups were doing. That was really neat watching them. Okay. There is a, a question and maybe uh, one of the students, you could answer this uh, off of our Twitch channel. Uh, was there, a, what was the most interesting part of the first culture uh, that you didn't maybe know much about before you got in that, that you learned uh, and that you walked into at your first event and, and were exposed to that you thought, okay, this part of the first culture is pretty exciting. Was there something that you'd learned about that or? When we first went to the competition and we saw how many people was there and how like crazy it was, I thought that was pretty cool. How everyone was like involved with each other and cheering people on. I thought that was pretty cool. Okay. Yeah, it was super like crazy. And there were so many people and they were all dressed up in costumes and had their hair crazy colors. We're just so excited and cheering on all the teams. Like it was really cool. Okay. Yeah. So definitely the, the team spirit uh, is something that is a, a big part of first and is an exciting thing. And we try to tell uh, all of you about it. I know it's one of those things that you just have to experience firsthand. Yeah. Uh, yeah Cause like, I didn't expect it to be that like crazy and fun and exciting. I was really impressed with how helpful everybody is. I mean, you told us it would be that way. But just that camaraderie in the entire group, everybody is competing and yet they're not, they're not out to squash anybody. Everybody helped the other teams and everybody wanted to see the other teams succeed. Uh, we had a team come over and help us figure out how to do the auto drive before we partnered up with them. And that was really ex exciting to see. Oh, good. So you guys really did firsthand uh, experience gracious professionalism. Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and uh, Alex and Paige, maybe we'll kind of wrap up with, uh, with you guys uh, on this question. Um, and we'll, we'll move on and bring uh, Devin in from uh, Girl Gang. Is, uh, was there a moment that maybe out, outside of the autonomous one, was there a moment of gracious professionalism you guys experienced at the event that you thought was pretty cool or? Yeah, we had a girl who came over, I can't remember her name, but she was from the school that the competition was at, and she came and she helped us, like, the entire day, like, she helped us, like, with our, um, our piston kept falling over, she helped us, like, zip tie it back up, like, she was there the entire time, and then the next day we came in and she was there again, like, she just kept helping us, it was so helpful. That's great. Yeah. And one of the rookie teams next to us, they were always helping us back and forth, making sure we we're doing good. And at one point, um, we were, had a problem with our pneumatics. So they explained how to do all that, and they gave us pneumatic cutters, and those were amazing, and it helped so much. And they even gave us um, air regulators that helped it from going down too fast, and those were amazing. And it was just they made our robot a lot quieter. <laughs> Well, good. Well, that's really exciting. Uh, and if you guys, uh, if you want to stay on uh, in case, we may have some general questions for the, the group. Um, so if you want to stay on the call here for the next few minutes, we're going to uh, bring Devin on here uh, from Girl Gang. Uh, and I'm going to uh, get the, here we go. So I got the presentation. Uh, I'm going to unmute Devin. There she is. Uh, so we have Devin, you're a high school senior. Um, I am the co-vice president in charge of business for Girl Gang, and I'm very excited to tell you about what we've done this, this season. Um, in order to qualify as a rookie team, you can have up to five experienced members who've been in first before, and we have um, four girls who've been on teams before. I did um, six years of FLL and on my FLL team core values were always 
the heart of everything we did. And so I really appreciated um, that all of our Girl Gang mentors really cultivated a culture on our team where core values and integrity were constantly being woven into the different conversations we were having. Our lead mentor talked to us about integrity on our very first meeting, how that has to be at the center of everything. I myself gave a presentation on the rest of the first core values at another early meeting. And I just, I'm really grateful that that's something that's been at the heart of everything we've been doing. Um, we have some really phenomenal mentors. Um, it's always that we're very grateful for. Um, it's always great, you know, when you can have mentors who have a lot of experience in first, um, such as our wonderful lead mentor, Mr. Jones. Um, but something else that's really been cool for us is that we've been able to expose new people to the FIRST program. Um, and um, so we have so many strong, positive, especially female mentors who teach our students. Um, and they've taught us some really great lessons in addition to all of these technical techniques. Um, we've been, they've shown us that Failures occur and we must view them, you know, as a positive learning experience and they're teaching us how to problem solve and persevere. And I just, I'm really grateful for that because I think those are just such valuable skills that are going to help you out no matter what field we end up going into. Um, I'll, I'll interrupt myself for a second just to talk about the, um, the photo that's on the screen right now. Um, all of our banners and our decals for our business cart and battery carts were donated by um, GL Graphics in Lafayette. And I think something that's really proven beneficial for our team in when we're looking for sponsorships is really sharing our story and why we're starting our team. Because when we spoke to the owners of GL Graphics and told them about how we're starting this all-female team, they were immediately like, oh my goodness, our son was on a first Lego League team. And that really cemented his love of programming. And now he's a engineer at Apple in California. And he's always saying how um, women are underrepresented in the STEM fields. And so they were um, immediately their business wanted to help us out and they donated their, they donated our banners and decals to us. And so we're very grateful for that. Um, <clears throat> but moving on to some of the things that we were able to do this season, um, we are a very student led team, which I'm very grateful for. Um, because we're such a small team, we only have 11 girls, we really got to have a hand in everything. Um, I was, I'm very proud of the fact that we built a sustainable business plan and a really um, solid team branding, um, something I really enjoyed from the get-go. We came up with branding guidelines. We have specific color codes for the different shades of pink we use in our logo. We have um, our graffiti logo in addition to some other um, images that we use to represent our team. We have a team kind of kind of like a slogan, um, a three-word thing. It's outreach, advocacy, and empowerment, which we, we our team brand kind of revolves around. Um, we're not a school-based team, so it's very important that we develop strong ties with our community, which is why outreach is so important to us. We also, it's just so fulfilling to us to work with these kids in our community. Um, I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Um, but we're also very um, into advocacy. Two of our team members are on the student board of director, my student board of directors, myself included. And so we've been involved with um, several events that have taken place at the State House. And we also plan this summer, um, our team hopes to get involved with organizations like Girls Inc. to do more advocacy work. Um, and then empowerment is just what we're here for. I, I just, I leave a meeting with these girls just feeling like I can do anything. And that's really what our team is trying to provide. And then our, our team, I feel like we're just learning so much um, in the other areas as well. Um, our for, we had an interesting way, I think, of building up tech skills. 
we started at one of our very first meetings by our, our girls built birdhouses to just learn how to use different tools. Um, from there, we moved on and we built our um, business and battery carts just to get more experience with tools, building something larger. And then we went on to build and design a robot that we're very, we're very proud of. Um, and I just, I love watching this team work together um, because, you know, the work ethic and the integrity and the teamwork skills, I just love seeing that kind of culture being built up. And I just, I think it's, it's just been so much fun. Um, but then towards the um, end of build season, it, I believe it was the first weekend in March, um, we felt that it was important to give our sponsors the opportunity to see what we had accomplished, especially since we knew we would not have been able to do what we did without their financial support and encouragement. Um, so we had an open house where they could come see our space. The Carpenters Union gave us such an incredible workplace that we're so grateful for. They built us field elements and they even built us an enclosed area that you can see in the photo where um, we could keep our robot and our tools and our business cart. And we're just so grateful for that. So we had a great time showing off that area to all the people who've been so supportive to us. Um, we also had a strong social media campaign to thank our sponsors throughout the season um, because we really want to maintain those relationships for, from season to season. And we feel that acknowledging all their support on a public platform is a great start in doing that. Um, but then something else that we really enjoyed was in addition to having our sponsors come see our workplace, we also had the opportunities to visit some of our sponsors at their workplace too. Um, we took tours of different manufacturing plants and foundries. Um, one, of, one of our team's favorites was a trip to a 3D printing facility. Um, and it's just, it was a great experience because it gives our students exposures to career opportunities. And it also helps us form a lasting partnership with our sponsors. Um, and then another partnership that's been really beneficial to us um, was our partnership with Greater Lafayette Commerce, especially um, a wonderful woman named Cara Webb. She's a strong business mentor and she's connected us with so many local businesses to help with building sponsorships. And she also helped connect us with a lot of outreach opportunities, um, especially at Matchbox Coworking Studios. If you've ever been there in Lafayette, it's, you know, it's an absolutely incredible space. We were very grateful to get to work with them to help run Coder Dojo events monthly. Um, it was just, it was so much fun to work with the kids hands-on, teaching them scratch programming. And just, I love, out outreach has always been one of my favorite things, my favorite parts of the first program. And just working with those kids and seeing their faces light up when, you know, their program works out the way they hope. And it's just, it's so fulfilling and it's a great way to help build up the first pipeline. Uh, um, we do have a question for you, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, from uh, from the Twitch channel, we have a question. Were you able to learn any new skills this year because of your participation on uh, being on a new team? I did actually. So um, in First Lego League, I did do, I participated in all aspects of the program. But once I got to FRC, I participated two years on my local team. And I was I just did business stuff, which I absolutely love. I love developing team branding and I love working on presentations. I love that. But because of um, now that I was on Grow Gang I, and our team is so small, we kind of, people had to step up and take new roles also. And so I got a lot of opportunities to work hands-on with our robot. And I had never done that before in FRC. So I was like stripping wires and using a rivet gun and using a drill and I had never, I'd never learned how to use those tools before and I love it now. Like I just think, I think it was, it was so much fun and such a cool learning experience that I'm very grateful for because of this team. Well, very good. The, um, the other questions I had asked, uh, you know, one of the things I had asked was, 
is there something moving forward? I know you're a graduating senior, uh, mm -hmm. but um, have if you were to come back, do you think there's anything uh, the team would be doing differently, or is there something a, a piece you'd be adding on to, based on the experience that you've had, um, uh, do differently, or it doesn't have to be do differently; it could just be uh, do you know in addition to uh, what you've been doing. Yeah, well, I think. I think we had a really great start and we did a lot of outreach in our community. Thanks uh, to Kara Webb who helped set us up with those opportunities. Um, a lot of the, all of those um, outreach events that we've done have all been with co-ed groups and we absolutely will continue doing that. But I think something we're gonna try and do in the future is also um, reach out to some all female groups to connect with as we are an all female team, like maybe working with um, local Girl Scout troops to help earn their robotics badge and things like that. Okay, great. Yeah, we have uh, some fantastic pictures here. Uh, big uh, example of all the sponsors you guys were able to go out and get. Um, definitely something for that. I talked to our teams about finding predictable sources of revenue every year. Uh, and uh, sustainability is tough because you have to ask for it every year. Mm -hmm. um, and robotics teams aren't, you know, making things to sell per se. So, uh, but this is a good start and definitely lay the groundwork and talking about your relationship with the chamber. Uh, talk to teams all the time about getting involved with their chamber. Uh, picture of the back of your guys' t-shirt there. Uh, it looks like you probably ran out of room. <laughs> um, you guys did a, a good job there. So um, as we uh, we've got um, about 10 minutes left to the uh, to the rookie session, uh, I don't really have we don't have a lot of questions coming through on the uh, on the Twitch channel. But um, was there a, I guess I could open this up to the other if there's the other uh, rookie folks are still on the call or not. Um, but you could also talk about this, too. Um, uh, Devin is, was there, what was a moment that made you really proud to be on the girl gang? Um, well, something that I've loved to see is just the growth in all of my teammates. Um, I feel like this team has offered so much in terms of ways to learn. Um, like I, I have examples for every single one of my teammates, but um, one girl, I've seen her, she, she was very shy and quiet at the beginning of the season, but I've seen her completely come out of her shell because of this team, and she's now such an effective communicator. She's stepping up and she's a leader, and I just, I love seeing that kind of transformation. And um, another girl, I remember she was showing me um, a, a piece, a piece that had just come in that she had um, catted on the computer herself, and she's now holding it in her hand, and I could just see how much that meant to her. And I just, I am honored to be on a team that's giving um, these girls these tools that um, that are just going to serve them so well in the future. Great. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll hold for a second so that uh, maybe the others um, can maybe turn their cameras or mics back on. Um, is there, and, and feel free to start with this, is there one thing uh, that you would, uh, if there's anybody else out there thinking about starting a team, um, or somebody maybe watches this later who's considering starting a team, what's one thing you'd say, okay, well, if you're going to start a rookie FRC team, you definitely should or should not, but maybe focus on the should. Is there something that they should do, Devin? And then we'll we'll kind of go around the channel real quick. Well, I think um, the biggest thing that maybe has benefited us, or one, one of the things that has proven really valuable is really just sharing your story with as many people as you can, because you never know um, where a connection could be made. Um, really sharing your personal stories, how you've been affected, um, what you hope to get out of this program, um, and just really your team mission. Um, I think that's really what has helped us, especially um, when we're looking for sponsorships, really just sharing what we're all about. That's a, a great way to connect with people. And that's how you're going to get support from your community, which is really, really important as a first team, especially because 
you know, running an FRC team isn't exactly cheap. So getting getting the support you need from your community is really important. And so sharing your story, I found, is the best way to do that. Okay. Uh, uh, Jennifer, it looks like you're unmuted. Was there something that you'd like to pass on some some wisdom to the to the next group of rookies? I think anybody starting a new group, as much as money is important, just finding those right mentors, reaching out to the right parents and getting them involved, finding those mentors that are going to get excited about coming every time and um, who are going to look forward to working with your kids and are going to have the patience to deal with the struggles, you know, even realizing that maybe the kids don't quite know how to, how to read a ruler yet, or I don't mean a ruler, a tape measure, um, you know, just down to the most basic thing that they just haven't had the experience. They've got all the book smarts in the world and the most brilliant students I've ever come across, but just learning those basic skills, um, but really just finding the right people to get involved. Um, our kids have been presenting to a lot of leaders in our community. Um, they did a wonderful job just kind of breaking apart and talking to our Rotary Club. And if we do that again, one of the main things they're gonna be switching up their speeches instead of just writing us a check, we'd really love for some of you to come back. Some, some of our community members are just so capable and intelligent and have so much to offer and just getting them to come back into the school and work with the kids or in your case, since you aren't a school club, <laughs> so just the, the people, people are important. Yeah. Braden, uh, you got, uh, anything? yeah. Yeah, um, I would say one thing that if we were going to do anything differently or, or should do for the next season would probably be, um, you were just saying people are important and they definitely are. We he, uh, probably could have had people um, doing different things. Um, there was a lot of us all trying to do multiple things at the same time. And there's so many facets to FRC that you've really got to have a good system Um and we thought we did of uh, breaking our team down into like different um, jobs. Um, but I think that's something that we'd probably work on for next year. Um, definitely having, or you should definitely have a system laid out of who does what um, and how those systems interact. Um, be way more successful. Well, and, and uh, we had a session last night, as a matter of fact, on uh, team structure, uh, led by uh, one of our mentors I uh, can go back and watch that but also um, that's another way uh, another great thing about first that all of you experienced was the gracious professionalism we have so many teams not just here in indiana but really all over the world of first that are willing to share how they do exactly what you're talking about so um you're right all three of those things are are very important um the reaching out to your community the asking, um, building that base of, of strong mentors, uh, and uh, and then also having that team structure to be able to uh, fill students in where uh, where they fit, finding leadership. Uh, I'm a former uh, high school soccer coach, and and people who've coached sports too. You know, you're always trying to figure out where do the athletes fit into the the team structure. What you know, what um, style of play are we going to have? Uh, and then uh, you get, and part of being a high school coach and a high school mentor of a program is you, the students that you have are the ones that show up. And so now you got to figure out uh, this year, the structure works this way. Next year, it might not, because we don't have the same set of strengths. Uh, and then for the newer teams, as you start to uh, build a strong group of students, as they start to get, become those, those freshmen uh, Alex and Paige, who joined us earlier, as they become seniors, it's going to be important for them to pass on <laughs> what they've learned um, and, and uh, kind of continue the tradition. So, well, thank you guys so much for uh, joining us uh, in, on the call today. Uh, loved hearing about your experiences uh, as rookies and, uh, and, ex and really excited to see um, the, the growth and, and what you guys do coming out of the gates as veterans uh, in the in the next go around. Uh, you've you've survived one build season. Um, and so now you know what it's like. So anyway, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I don't really see um, 
much other. We did have one question, I suppose, Devin, why don't you stay on real quick? Um, we do just have a couple minutes left before the next presenter. But uh, one question is about the legislative stuff. Uh, there was a, when visiting with the legislative members, uh, did you have any reactions or how supportive did you find them? Um, maybe uh, with about two or three minutes left, maybe you could talk a little bit about your experience at NAC in Washington, and then maybe a little bit about your experience here in Indiana. I know that's a lot to do in about two minutes, but mm -hmm. I, I, I believe in you. Well, thank you. I, this is my favorite thing to talk about because I actually want to go into STEM advocacy work as a career path. Um, but last summer in June of 2019, I attended the first national advocacy conference in Washington, DC. Um, so if you don't know what that is, it's basically a three day conference, a day and a half is spent training on um, how to advocate for different bills that will support STEM education. And then the third day is spent actually on Capitol Hill meeting with your representatives in Congress and sharing your first story, sharing how bills such as the Every Student Succeeds Act, specifically Title IV Part A has been um, beneficial in Indiana, in our community. We've seen um, great results from that. And so sharing that kind of story with our representatives in Congress really shows them that this bill is working and that it's something that they should continue to support. And so that was just such a great experience. I really enjoyed it. It's the reason I now want to go into STEM advocacy work because I found that it's an effective way to give more kids the opportunity to get involved with FIRST. Um, but cool. then on at, a, at the State House, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that too? Then um, I know we didn't, we had a couple of uh, legislators interact with us um, at the most recent day, but were there one or two thing takeaways you had from doing that at the State House? Yeah, so a couple of weeks ago, I think um, we had our um, first day at the State House where we had, I think, about eight teams from the different levels of programs. Um, gathering at the state house and we had our robots out and the FLL teams had poster boards up and we were speaking with um, different representatives there and really sharing our first story and I just I think it's so empowering especially for um, students who are still in school to have all of these adult representatives who are kind of a big deal for our state right and they're taking such an interest in what we're doing and they're really seeing value in that. And I think it's a great thing for us to show them that all that we're doing and all and also share the ways that they can help grow this program. And when they take that so seriously, I think it's really empowering, especially to have that kind of support as students still in school. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much, uh, Devin. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for being here. And uh, we're gonna transition on now uh, to our next conversation in the uh, our virtual conference for this evening. Uh, our next up is our Fin Talk, uh, the um, how HVAC uh, engineers save the world. With us, we have uh, Megan Tobias. Um, Megan, welcome. Hi, thank you. I'm glad to be okay. here. Yeah. And um, uh, hopefully we'll be, uh, we've got you on screen. And if you've got um, uh, whatever it is you need to share with us and take it away. All right, let me just get my presentation pulled up here. Uh, uh, that thing, what am I sharing right now? That's not what I wanted to share, hold on. <laughs> My apologies here. That's okay. Try that. You guys seeing PowerPoint now? Yeah. Yep. All right. Back engineers save lives. Sweet. Um, so, um, brief introduction um, of myself. Um, my name is Megan Tobias. I am a Purdue BSME 2014 grad, um, professional engineer in the state of Indiana. Um, I'm also a FIRST alum. Um, I was on 
FRC 2171 Robo Dogs at a current point in high school. Um, the team was started my freshman year and I was on the electrical and mechanical teams all four years. And it was my experience on that team that made me decide to go in, into engineering. Um, currently, um, I work for open control systems out of Indianapolis here as a controls and quality engineer. I'm going on almost six years full time with them. I've had a couple of different positions during that time um, and did two summer internships um, with them while I was still in school. Um, so I'm gonna just kind of go over a brief overview of HVAC design, um, HVAC control systems and how that relates to healthcare. Um, and so for those that don't know, HVAC is heating, ventilation and air conditioning. Um, which if you think about the thermostat in your house that controls your furnace and condensing unit to give you heating and cooling. Um, but what I get to work on is all of the big um, equipment that are used in hospitals, offices, um, schools, like the really big cool stuff that you can actually like stand inside of. Um, so without further ado, um, just a quick um, look at some notable clients that I've been able to work with in this um, field. Um, One America, Community Health Network, Disney, um, Lucas Oil Stadium, Universal down in Florida, because we do have an office down there too. Um, so um, HVAC design, uh, within the HVAC industry, there are many different roles you can play. One is as a design engineer. Um, so you'll, they do heating and cooling load calculations um, for a building. For each specific room even, they'll take into account the size of the space, the number of people that are going to be in that space and what those people are doing even within that space. Are they sitting at a desk? Are they up walking around? Are they male or female? Um, is it a mix of people? Um, is it an operating room, an isolation room or other kind of critical space such as a pharmacy like within a hospital? Um, and so they'll do those calculations in order to figure out um, how much air heating and cooling is needed um, to achieve the occupancy comfort level um, in the space. So um, thinking about a hospital, a typical hospital is going to have um, what we call a heating hot water system. So boilers and pumps to pump hot water out through the space um, to where it's needed. They're gonna have a chilled water system that has chillers um, and cooling towers and pumps to produce chilled water um, to get cooling where it's needed. Um, so they'll take all of these things into account to decide how much hot water are we going to need? How much chilled water are we going to need um, to pump to our air handling units, which are what um, force air to flow out through the building into all the different spaces um, for your heating and cooling. Um, so they're gonna do all these calculations to figure out what exactly are they going to need um, so that they can size and select the different equipment um, for the space. And then they'll, from there, they're gonna do ductwork and piping layouts um, and draw up um, mechanical schematics showing where all of that needs to be installed in a building. And then they're going to write um, what we call sequences of operation. So how do these various pieces of equipment need to be programmed to achieve um, the end goal, which is occupant comfort? Um, for example, at the room level, how do we keep it at 72 degrees, let's say? Um, for an air handling, air handling unit that's serving air to the spaces, um, what do we need to do to achieve um, duct pressure set point to make sure we're getting the airflow we need? Um, so that's one aspect. Um, of the HVAC industry. Um, then you have controls engineers, which like myself, which will we'll take the design documents from the design engineer and then lay out what all is needed for the control system to make all of that work the way that it needs to. Um, so a typical day in the life of a controls engineer, our first step, we're going to look at the mechanical plans and specification books. Um, to see what they have detailed out, what equipment there is in the building, where is it, um, what types of sensors are allowed or desired, like for a thermostat, for example, do they want it to have a display or not? Um, 
things of that nature. And then they'll also have what the sequence of operation is intended to be. Um, so we'll go through and take inventory of all of the equipment to get an idea of how many controllers we're gonna need and then how we might network those together to bring them into what we call a global controller, um, which networks all of the controllers in a system into one access point. Um, and from there, we can um, create a graphical user interface, um, trend data, and um, host schedules and all of that from the global um, access point. And so once we kind of have that inventory, we're gonna go system by system and do um, flow schematics, point layouts on all of our controllers. Um, so, with, so where are all my temperature sensors going to? What controller has that? Um, make our, all of our wiring diagrams, bill of materials, picking out all of the parts and pieces that we're gonna need um, and also sizing valves um, for the system. And we're gonna make a comprehensive drawing package that we're then gonna hand over um, to our subcontract installer to go actually install all of this stuff out in the field. Um, we also do programming. Um, I do a lot more programming as a mechanical engineer than I thought I ever would, um, but it, it's pretty fun. Um, so we'll take um, and build a system database of all of our controllers. And then for each different system, we translate the sequence of operations from the, from the words into programming. Um, the particular programming tool that we use, you can see here is kind of visual based. Um, you drag and drop the programming blocks, set up your different variables and parameters, and then you have to sequence them in the correct order um, to make sure your order of operations happens in the way that you want. Um, if you've seen lab view, when I'm describing it to other people and don't have the picture, I kind of reference lab view as like the closest thing. Um, there are some other um, controls companies that do line code for um, programming con HVAC control systems that would be pr probably most similar to C. Um, if any of you have experienced programming in C. Um, and as I mentioned before, we'll hand over our drawing set to our subcontract electricians. They'll go out in the field, install and wire up according to what we have shown. Um, we sometimes do self-install. It depends on the size of the job. If it's something really small, we'll probably just take care of it ourselves. Um, and then we have uh, field technicians who go out and do a, what we call a point check on the system to ensure everything's working properly. Um, for example, I told this fan to run, did it actually come on? Am I seeing status feedback? Um, and we'll do that for each individual system from like room level all the way up to the big air handling units, which there's a picture here in the middle of an, an example of an air handler. Um, and then there on the left, that's a cooling tower. Um, and at my company, controls engineers also assist um, with this process when needed, um, especially with what we call commissioning. Um, we will go out in the field once the system's been started up and run each program and system through its paces to make sure it's working as intended, make tweaks as necessary, um, because it might, it might work in theory when you're sitting in the office, um, but then in practice, there's typically always some tweaks that need to be made, but that's part of the fun of it. Um, Sometimes we also deal with um, people who are called commissioning agents. Um, that's another role in the HVAC industry. Um, these are people that are usually working for another outside firm and they'll come in and do system checks and run the system through its paces to make sure that all of the design intent is being met. Um, and I alluded to um, graphical user interfaces earlier. Um, so at the end of a project, there's gonna be a GUI for the building system that allows the facility management team to see how their system is running. Um, they can change different set points, view trend log data, um, manage alarms. Um, we can add alarms to critical points so that if something goes wrong, they'll get an email notification or even a text message um, letting them know that something's wrong and it needs to be addressed. Um, and the trend data, um, is actually pretty cool. You can use that to analyze 
how efficiently the system is or is not operating. And it'll kind of show you areas where improvements can be made. Um, and you can even somewhat automate that um, to the point where the system like learns as it gathers more data. Um, for example, we'll have an optimum start sequence, um, right? Because when the building's occupied, everything's running. And then when everyone leaves for the day, it generally goes to an unoccupied mode. Um, but for optimum start, it'll look at all of the different zone temperatures in a building and it based on outside air temperature um, and what the general normal time of day schedule is for the building it can calculate hey um, this is the time that i need to start in order to be at a comfortable temperature in the spaces by the time people start coming in um, so just different efficiency things that you can do um, just by analyzing trend data um, and we also um, train staff on how to use their graphical user interface and take feedback and make adjustments to the look and feel so that um, they're happy with how it is. At the end of the day, they're the ones using it. So um, we wanna make sure that they're happy with it. Um, now, how does all of this relate to healthcare? Um, um, I kind of mentioned before uh, isolation rooms and operating rooms and things like that. Hospitals have these special cases where they require a more intense level of control. There's more variables involved. Um, for example, in operating rooms, you're more concerned about humidity and room pressure in addition to temperature. Um, so pharmacies, labs, um, operating rooms and isolation rooms. Um, have a little bit more, like I said, a little bit more of a complex system. Um, so here in an operating room, um, we'll have, oh, that's not what I wanted to, it to do. Um, we'll have a box supply. Oh, don't know what's going on with that. that sorry, technical difficulty. All right, well, I'll just have this, you can still see the slide. It'll stop animating it. Um, you'll have what we call a VAV box, a variable air volume box serving air into the space. And we also have one that's pulling air out of the space. Um, and, you, and they sequence together um, in order to maintain a positive pressure in your operating room as compared to the outside corridor here. Um, and the purpose of that is to keep your outside contaminants out. Um, when someone's going into surgery and you're um, in that kind of a situation, you don't want there to be any kind of contaminant that can um, get into the space and then end up harming the patient. Um, so they'll have the two um, variable air volume boxes and then they'll have a pressure monitor um, on the outside of the space you can see what the status of the room is from the outside without having to go in if the room is in use. And then within the room, there'll be another monitor um, that'll show all the people within the operating room, um, whether or not the pressure in the room is good, what your temperature is, where the hum humidity is, and it allows you to kind of adjust um, set points from there. And you can even have a monitor back at the nurse's station so that you can see the status of all of your different rooms from one, one spot. Um, and locally, these displays, um, like I said, will show you status. Um, there's local alarming with audible alarms so that if someone's nearby, they're made aware of it right away. And then that also can get pulled back into um, the control system so that it can email alarms out to the facility staff if something goes wrong um, so that they're made aware of it and can address it um, as quickly as possible. And another scenario are the isolation rooms. Um, I apologize that it, it kept animating away from my slide. Um, so these, these rooms, rather than being positive pressure in the room compared to the corridor, you want those to be negative pressure as compared to your hallway to keep all of the pathogens within the space 
um, and contained so that you don't end up infecting other people in your hospital um, with whatever pathogens that particular patient has. <coughs> um, and in this case, um, you can kind of see here, there's a main door straight into the patient room that's only gonna be used when you're taking the patient in or out of the space. Um, once the patient is in the room, um, all of your healthcare staff are gonna come through this ante room here and then into the patient room um, as an extra precaution, again, so that you, your pathogens stay contained. Um, and again, you're gonna have the monitors there for visual and audible indication um, if there's a problem in the space, um, whether or not the room is occupied. And in this case, to make the room negative, you are pulling more air out of the room than you are supplying to the room. Um, so that's a little bit on how that works. Again, with the displays, you can see the different modes. You can put the room into cleaning mode so that when the, you have the cleaning staff in there, it's not gonna send you alarms to the system if the door is open. Um, the, you can set the room into vacant mode, um, positive or negative pressure mode and isolation case again. Um, you wanna keep that negative. And let's see if I can start. If this slide will stay, nope, hold on, sorry. <laughs> Current slide. Um, and another um, critical space in a hospital are your pharmacies or oncology suites, <coughs> um, which in the pharmacy and oncology areas, you even have the added um, fume hood control, um, which is pretty cool. Um, again, just making sure you're keeping things out of the spaces that you wanna keep out, keeping things in the spaces that you wanna keep in, um, any kind of hazardous things like back here in your fume hood room, you wanna make sure that that all stays contained um, and doesn't get out and harm other areas. Um, and um, part of why I thought of doing this presentation is obviously um, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, and one thing that's happened um, with me and work uh, um, in the last two weeks um, is we have a local hospital um, that we have been helping to convert regular patient rooms into temporary isolation rooms in anticipation of an influx of COVID-19 patients. Um, so they've been really proactive in preparing um, so that in case they do need them, they already have them um, ready to go. Um, this particular hospital already had 15 um, dedicated isolation rooms. Um, and we have added 24 additional um, isolation rooms in the last two weeks. Um, so now they have 39 total um, and there are more rooms that they would like to convert next week. Um, what's interesting here, these rooms weren't initially designed to be isolation rooms, so they don't have the two <coughs> um, BAV boxes serving the space. They just had the one. Um, so what they're actually doing is, are installing exhaust fans in the windows um, in order to expel enough air from the space versus what's being supplied to make sure that the room goes into a negative pressure situation. Um, and we've installed those little monitors outside each of these, each of these additional rooms um, and brought them online. And I've actually made a dashboard for them and they can click on each individual um, room and it'll pull up this graph for them with trend data on what the um, airflow to the space is. This is actually one of the rooms that already was an isolation room. So it also has, it's got your supply airflow down there on the bottom in the blue, um, your return airflow up top in the pink, um, right? You, you want your return to be higher than your supply. Because as you can see, that'll cause your negative pressure in the green. 
Um, you can see how it kind of fluctuates as the airflow fluctuates or as people open the door um, to go in or out. Um, but this way they have easy access to all of this data for all of their rooms um, to make sure that the rooms are um, performing as needed and they can address any problems. And they're also getting alarms um, to their system so that they know when they go out of pressure range and they can address it right away. Um, because obviously we you don't you want to keep that contained. So um, it's one of those things that I sometimes I don't think about how I can directly impact people being a controls engineer, um, right? Everyone always you want to help people, but sometimes it's kind of hard to see how you're helping people. But this um, happening in the last two weeks definitely um, brought that to the forefront. I might not be directly interacting with patients. Um, or the healthcare workers, but I'm doing some things behind the scenes um, that are going to help them out. So if anyone has any questions, um, questions about what I do, how my, what my college experience was, anything, um, more than happy to answer. Yeah, uh, Megan, this is Chris. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't have a lot uh, coming through on the, um, the Twitch channel, but uh, for someone who's interested in going into controls, mm -hmm. um, would that be more um, of a computer or electrical engineering uh, career path for them? Is there in school or, or really is grounded in any engineering going to be okay for your um, kind of work? There would definitely be advantages um, to having like the electrical background, but really just having an engineering degree in general and having that problem solving way of thinking um is beneficial um i found for me having the mechanical background and like the theory behind how all of the equipment works and the heat transfer and the thermodynamics um has helped me as well um but yeah I, electrical might have a little bit more of an advantage but i would say any any di engineering discipline uh your experience in first um you talked a little bit about you were on the robo dogs mm -hmm. at uh, 2171. Uh, was there takeaways from that experience that you feel like you're, you use on a daily basis or? Um, again, that was my introduction to like the problem solving way of thinking and that mindset on how do you approach a problem? Um, and then definitely like just the hands-on experience um, and knowing how to use different tools and get your hands into um, into some electrical wiring and things, um, beneficial for sure. Um, there are times I'm out in the field um, troubleshooting. Um, that's one aspect that I really enjoy, um, getting my fluke meter out and testing voltages and am I getting my signal where I need it um, and kind of tracing the problem out. Um, so I see Alex, Ask what's your favorite thing about this job? Um, I would say the troubleshooting, like when things aren't quite working right, getting in there out in the field and getting my hands into some electrical panels and fixing the problem. Uh, yeah, we had the, is this a field that is easy to find employment in nearly any area or are there areas that are, it's good to be in? Like in other words, geographically speaking, Indianapolis, Chicago, or do you, um, could you, could you pretty much be anywhere? You could pretty much be anywhere. Um, I mean, this is something that everybody, there's a need for it everywhere. Um, and even I even um, worked remotely um, prior to this whole um, situation um, out in Idaho, um, just to try out living somewhere else. My company was awesome and let me do that. Um, but even out there in Idaho, I was talking to other um, controls companies. I mean, it's pretty much any, anywhere. Um, there, there's a larger city, there's going to be a couple of competing companies. So uh, we had a question. Um, do you have any books you would recommend? Oh, books. Um, do I have, I don't know that I have it sitting right here. Um, so um, a good resource, if you have any interest in HVAC or controls, um, ASHRAE, um, the American Society of Heating and Refrigeration and 
air, air conditioning. I, I probably flubbed that. Um, it's been a second. Hold on. American Society of, of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. There you go. Um, which I'm a, um, a member of. Um, they have a lot of good um, articles, resources. Um, some of it, unfortunately, you have to be a member um, to get access to, but there are student um, memberships available. Like I know they, there are like college um, associated um, memberships um, that aren't quite as cost prohibitive. Um, Cause they, they have handbooks that they publish every year um, in, in regards to different um, um, topics relating to HVAC design and or controls. Um, so uh, we had uh, another question from the Twitch channel. Uh, in the current environment, um, not just adding another hospital bed or putting ICU into the hallway, how creative do you have to be to upgrade hospitals? How do the mobile hospitals that are being built, um, sorry, uh, work from HVAC perspective? So some of the, I don't, and you might not have answers to these, maybe there's some links we can get, but some of the mobile hospitals being built, what are the HVAC um, implications there? Um, so I don't have any personal experience with the mobile hospital situation, um, but I would imagine that they're just gonna have like portable, um, kind of similar to how I mentioned they're putting temporary exhaust fans into <clears throat> these normal patient rooms to make them into isolation rooms. They're, pro they're gonna have something similar, like a temporary unit that's serving um, air into the space and then an exhaust source to take the air out. Um, Cause they do, they do sometimes use portable things like that on um, new construction sites just to provide temporary um, conditioning um, so I'd imagine that that's what they're doing. Um, yeah. So a, a non, uh, non kind of emergency or, you know, COVID kind of question in terms of, of HVAC with the uh, change of seasons, how hard is it to switch a, a large building like a hospital from heating to cooling and, and back? Oh, um, so um, not very difficult at all. Um, it's pretty seamless in like the newer, um, newer buildings um, because you have what, we call a four pipe system. So you have dedicated pipes for your heating hot water and your cooling, your chilled water. Um, so you can, in theory, run chilled and hot water at the same time, should you need it. Um, versus back in the day, they would sometimes do what we call a two pipe system for cost savings. So you have one set of pipes running out um, through your building and it's either heating or cooling. You can't have both. Um, in that situation, um, I've really only seen that in some older schools. Um, it does get quite difficult, right? Because you get, you'll get a random warm day or a random cold day. And then by the time you switch everything over, you're falling behind on keeping up with your load. Um, but in, in your hospitals, it's really not, not an issue. That's a, yeah, I know some of us who went to school in some old buildings had those uh, mm -hmm. Early, those spring days when the heat heat was still on and yeah uh, we wish that uh we could open windows or or cool the building down or whatever but yeah those are uh, definitely some good questions uh we just got a couple of minutes left uh thank you so much for your time and sharing your uh your experience and your expertise uh with us um the uh oh there is just one last question you mm -hmm. probably will be able to guess who it came from who's a role model for you um, a role model for me, ooh, um, there's so many, um, my number one role model is probably my dad. Um, honestly, uh, he, he's a double ET from Purdue. He's actually, um, a facilities manager for Tupica New County School Corporation. Um, and he was the one that kind of pushed me like, oh, you should do HVAC dad. And I was like, I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> but here I am. So. Wow. Well, uh, thanks so much again uh, for joining us. It's interesting. And it's, uh, it seems a very complicated world in terms of trying to uh, manage airflow in a hospital, e even in a non pandemic situation mm -hmm. uh, with all the stuff that you talked about just in a, in a normal situation. So mm -hmm. 
Uh, thank you again. Oh, thank you. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, we appreciate your time. And we're going to move on now to our break. Uh, we've got about a 15 minute break. We've got a uh, um, slideshow of awesome pictures taken by our, our great media folks. I'm going to pull that up here for, uh, for folks to see. And uh, we'll be back in about 15 minutes where we will be having a, a conversation, uh, a panel discussion uh, for about 45 minutes uh, being led by Carl uh, from Purdue First. Uh, Carl's gonna be speaking with a couple of mentors from some veteran teams here in Indiana, uh, talking a little bit about going from surviving to thriving as a team and, and what was the tipping point. So definitely very interested in uh, hearing that conversation coming up. That'll be starting right at 545. So thank you everybody. We'll, uh, we'll talk to everyone soon.
All right. Well, we are back, everybody. Uh, again, this is Chris Osmond with First Indiana Robotics, a program director, uh, part of our 2020 virtual conference series, uh, providing a variety of topics for all of you. Uh, we've had a good evening so far. Uh, lots of good things from self-care during isolation, meeting our 2020 rookies. Uh, very interesting presentation about the HVAC uh, career path for Megan Tobias, uh, an engineer. Uh, now we are going to bring on Carl from PFP to uh, run a panel conversation with some uh, mentors of some veteran teams here in Indiana to talk a little bit about the, the tipping point of maybe where they kind of went from just surviving to thriving. So Carl, uh, if, you, if you're on, you want to join? Um, we'll... I guess. So uh, introduce, name... introduce your guests and we'll uh, let you go from there. Sorry. Awesome. So my name is Carl Lanskren, and I am a mentor for Precision Guessworks. Precision Guessworks is a team that's comprised of FRC team 1646 and the FTC team 17012. Uh, we are based out of the Purdue area, and I'm currently a Purdue student. Um, in a moment, I'll introduce our two guests. Um, and during this talk, we're going to be talking about um, surviving versus thriving and what was the tipping point for these teams now one of the things i first want to look into is what does it mean to survive versus thrive um, if you look at marion webster's dictionary for definition um, they suggest that uh, surviving is a the ability to um, to remain alive to exist to continue to function and prosper um, versus to thrive is to, um, let me pull it up here. To thrive is essentially to grow vigorously or to gain wealth, uh, possessions, and um, to progress or realize a goal. And when I discuss with people uh, about surviving and thriving, um, I think a lot of people um, assume surviving is bad. And I think in no way is surviving a bad thing. It's an amazing thing to be doing as a team. It means you are still impacting students. You are helping them um, achieve these goals, be inspired, do outreach. But you're not necessarily growing towards um, a better ultimate goal, which I think I associate a lot more with thriving. And so thriving is by kind of the definition and how we might talk about it here, this idea of going beyond where you're currently at. Um, I've had teams come to me and say, well, I feel like we're kind of in a rut. Um, we, we've just kind of been at the same level and thriving is the, the idea of taking it to the next level, essentially. So the two guests that I have brought on um, uh, are people that I felt um, have come from teams that I have seen major um, improvements over the last five years um, in what I would characterize as teams that I truly think are thriving teams. Um, so um, I and they will kind of talk about our experiences and the journey that led us to thriving, um, what things impacted us and how we feel that um, other teams can implement things that helped us reach the goals we have. Um, so first off, um, I'm going to introduce introduce Alex Henry from Team 4272 to talk about um, Maverick Boiler Robotics. Thanks, Carl. Um, so hi, I'm Alex Henry. I'm the one of the lead mentors on Team 4272. I was a member of PFP uh, for four years, and now I'm a controls engineer at Dana in Lafayette. So we've actually, we've come a long way the past few years. Um, so I think if we talk about our tipping point, we probably had that in about 2017. Do we go into that, Carl? Are we good to start? Yeah, I would love to kind of talk about that. And so go on and kind of talk about what you think that was for you guys. Cool. So um, a lot of that was just kind of dumb luck that we started doing really well. 2017, we had gone from a team that struggled to get picked to a team that was... Uh, we were ranked number one at our first event, had done really well, ended up going to the world championship that year. So we picked a good strategy and that helped us. I don't know if that was totally on purpose, but it worked out really well. 
And I think that was a tipping point for us because it really got our students excited and it got our mentors excited. It got our community excited about our team. In that year, we found that because everybody was really pushing toward that common goal of going to Worlds, uh, we got a lot more funding. We ended up getting some really awesome corporate uh, sponsorship with Caterpillar, as well as a few other companies. And those are those are still companies that are sponsoring us today. So that really kind of pushed us to that next level um, is going from kind of a team that was struggling to pay the registration fee every year, uh, maybe making state, maybe getting picked, just trying to get a robot in the field was a big goal to a team that was really looking to expand our outreach, uh, kind of expand what we do, uh, push uh, to bigger, better things in our robots, et cetera. Does that kind of give you a background? Yeah, so um, based on that, then how do you feel like that tipping point, that moment in time has affected you guys as a team and what um, differences do you see in the team um, like in today over this last build season compared to um, before that? I mean, really for us, it's kind of a night and day difference. Uh, we, before we started in that, uh, we were really, we were just really struggling. Um, a lot of, uh, we really didn't know what we were doing. I would say we really weren't pushing to be so much better. I think we were just kind of pushing to survive, put something on the field, not really thinking strategically, not really thinking about the quality of our machine, uh, things like that. But once we, once we kind of got together, we tried to establish more leadership, got excited, got a little more funding. We found that we're starting to think about things, think about improving our robot. Uh, from season to season, looking at previous seasons and finding out ways we can improve, uh, things like that. So it's a really, really big difference. We've also, just in sheer number of mentors and number of students, we were, uh, I think that 2015 or 2017 year, we took about eight or nine students to Worlds. Uh, we're seeing now we're a team of about 30 students. We've also dramatically increased our mentor pool, things like that. So by doing well and getting that excitement building and starting to focus on doing better and better, we found our team has grown. The community knows our team better, our image has grown. So it's just a matter of we're now focusing on continuous improvement rather than just getting a robot on the field. Yeah. And so what, what I guess is right now, what are you doing to look into that continuous improvement? What is the next steps for you guys so there are lots of different things. Uh, I mean, over the past season, I think we've uh, we've gotten way more into the quality of our machines. So um, our electrical system has seen tons of different things. We've looked at uh, different connectors, different recommendations from teams and really put in a lot of effort into that. In addition, uh, we've got a, a couple pieces of CNC equipment and we've been work working on refining our process to try to make sure we're putting a quality machine on the field doing things smart. Uh, this past season, we've actually done a great job with sensors and relying on our sophomore, uh, software team a little bit more. So in the past, we've been a very mechanical driven team. We're now starting to think bigger and put some, put some uh, things for our software team. So we're always looking at our previous seasons and thinking about what we can do better uh, moving forward. And I think after this season, we're still, th this whole COVID-19 thing has kind of messed up our flow a little bit. Uh, but we're already looking at different things, how we can uh, do more improved CADing, how we can improve our CAD process, how we can uh, do more things to reduce the weight on the robot and just feel the better machine. So the whole team is constantly looking at ways to improve, looking at things that were difficult this season and how we can make that flow smoother to the next season. So it's a different way of looking. We're not worried about, we know we're gonna feel the robot next year, but now we're starting to think, that, oh, there's a whole bunch of other things we can do to keep getting better. And I think that's a, that's a different change. It's a change in mentality from the team. I think it's a really good thing. It's helping us have a better program, a more inspirational program for our students. So kind of speaking about that um, mentality that you talked about just there briefly at the end, um, what, what do you think is the best way for other teams to, to kind of foster this type of mentality? Hmm. So I think the biggest thing is just getting your students uh, excited about this and then just looking at how to keep getting better. You're even the cheesy poops every year fielding an amazing robot, but they're always looking at things that might have been a bottleneck, might have been difficult to make that could have been better. And they're looking at how they improve every year. So I think that's really important for teams to look at 
is what can we, like, we're never perfect, but what can we do for the next season to be even better than the previous one? And I think it's really important to reflect on your season and then push forward in that direction. So, and with that kind of a big final question I have for you is, you know, um, we've got teams out there that maybe are looking at this and saying, well, I don't have, um, I don't have this like just random, you know, moment of 2017. So let's say uh, um, you had to completely start over. You moved to a different town and you were starting a new FRC team. How do you think that you um, would best manufacture the this kind of tipping point almost um, for, uh, for, your new t for a new team? So I think looking back at 2017, the biggest thing that we did is we played the game to about the simplest extent possible. Uh, 2017, this is really easy, but I've even seen teams last year and this year uh, that built amazing simple robots that accomplished the game really well. And I think focusing on things like quality, um, quality of electrical components, staying alive on the field, uh, even things like making your bumpers look good and just the overall machine function and then dialing back a little bit on what your robot can maybe do and just focusing on one task uh, is a way better way to improve your odds of being that competitive team. And then as you get those core skills down, you're building solid robots, they're maintaining connection to the field, they're driving well, they're scoring points uh, very consistently, uh, you can start looking at pushing your boundaries, becoming more efficient, and then becoming a great team and doing all of the things that the field would offer. So I think it's it's really important to just go with the simple tasks and worry more about the quality of your machine uh, rather than the things your machine might be able to do once or twice in your shop. Awesome. And so that's something that you talked about the machine. What about, for example, the student? It's how would you kind of manifest, manifest a similar thriving mentality within students? So I think it's important for the students to just uh, be excited about what we do. And then I think it's kind of important to pretend you're a good team and do things right. Yeah, you can take shortcuts and sometimes those will be well, but I think uh, with mentors encouraging students and students encouraging themselves to do things like catch your robot, manufacture things well, uh, take pride in your work and push that way, I think is really important. And you'll find that those, uh, those tips or those, those things are gonna really pay off in the long run. And if you start if you start acting like the good teams act, you're going to start becoming a really good high end team. So awesome, cool. So um, we'll quickly ask uh, Chris: Is there any questions from Twitch uh, for Alex? Not right now. No. Okay. Cool. Well, Alex, we'll still keep you around, but we're going to switch over to our next speaker uh, in case any questions come up. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, that's again, Alex Henry from 4272 Maverick Boiler Robotics. So now we're going to switch over to um, another one of my good friends, I would say, um, Sean Vaness from 1720. So if you could introduce yourself. Me or not, can you hear me? Yep, we can okay. hear you now. I'm unmuted. All right, good. Uh, yes, I'm Sean Vaness. Uh, I'm the team president and a mentor with 1720. Uh, we have been based out of uh, Muncie for quite a few years, and now we're uh, in Matthews. We've got a new shop, and we're kind of in between Muncie and Marion and have a bigger, bigger pool of uh, schools and uh, students that we're looking to bring in since we're a community-based team. Awesome. So could you talk a little bit, um, we've seen it's amazing work from 1720 over the past couple of years and it well they've always felt like they i felt like they feel a good robot it feels like in the last two uh years you guys have been really pulling ahead of the crowd so if you could talk maybe a little bit about um what you felt has kind of helped your team to thrive and if you felt there was a certain tipping point and what um there are a couple different different points um the first one being thank you to uh, First Indiana for switching over to a district. Um, I think that's been a big, big help for everybody, really. Um, going back to that same year in 2015, which I think was the first year for districts in Indiana, um, that kind of was our breakout year that we had a really good robot. And uh, 
we kind of found out early on that that uh, we possibly had a chance of going for the uh, state championship, and then um, we made it to made it to worlds, and uh, success kind of breeds success, and uh, that helps helps quite a bit. So based upon that, um, have you noticed any like certain things and aspects um, with your your students that has or fellow mentors that has kind of changed over time that has kind of led to these more thriving environments um i would say for teams that are newer to go out and and look for grants try to get some equipment um, that can help you in the future um cad cad's a big thing uh designing doing a lot of prototyping um, but look for specific things if, if there's any way possible that you can get a, a cheap CNC, uh, a small, even a small laser cutter. Um, those things, working with CAD and getting the students really involved in the design process and having some good mentors who can teach them all of that is, is paramount. Cool. So could you walk us through a little bit about 1720s process and how they go about um, in, the, in the pre off season um, build season and in the competition season? Well, sure. Uh, we do things throughout the year uh, as far as having some uh, some classes and try to get some students together and work a little bit more on fine tuning some of the skills. Um, again, CAD's a big one. Uh, programmers. Uh, just anything in the machine shop. Um, from that point, we we go through our recruiting process in the fall, uh, trying to pull new students in. Uh, we try to have them in place uh, by early December. That way we have at least a month to work with students uh, so they're not coming in cold uh, and don't know, know a screwdriver you know, from a drill press. Um, really there we go into uh into kickoff uh we like inviting some other teams over and uh doing kind of a, a collaborative kind of walkthrough uh we have have generally had several teams over for kickoff at our shop um and then we go through the entire process of the game uh, really really try to decide what it is that we want to focus on what we want to do it always starts off um like alex said go for something simple to begin with, something you know that you're really good at and uh, you can accomplish that task. Then really kind of go from there and, and bring, things, bring things up and into place. Uh, let's see. Um, the brainstorming and, and really the, the, the whole process of, of trying to figure out what it is that you really, really want to do for the game. Since it's different every year, um, easiest thing is to first thing just really decide on your drivetrain and then and then go from there and um, really just uh, kind of add processes and tasks uh, to to that mix and usually each year it seems so especially over the last few years that we've uh, we've pretty much kind of really tried to go for everything uh, with the exception of last year, we really wanted to be a uh, really good low low bot, and uh, we were able to do that do that really well, and uh, the success came with it. So awesome! So, what would your suggestion be? Um, not even necessarily for rookie teams, because I think. Um, there's a lot that rookie teams can do, but for teams that feel like they've kind of stagnated in one place and haven't really grown much over the past couple of years, what would your suggestion be to help them improve? Um, anything, again, the community outreach is great. Uh, festivals, uh, going to schools, libraries, uh, some schools, a lot of elementary schools have uh, science fairs. Uh, we do that quite a bit. And uh, our, our big thing, uh, it's always been harder trying to find students who are already in high school uh, recruiting. So we have, have started up a couple of Lego teams. Uh, we're looking this year to possibly even expand that to 
maybe from two to four to even six and having those between multiple towns. Um, but getting kids younger and, uh, and really involved in that process and uh, getting them hooked on, on robotics and then, and then bringing them on up. Awesome. So um, do you have any suggestions for, um, let's see here, um, for people who, oh, I would say this, let's say you are looking, what, would you, what do you think is the one most important thing out of everything you've talked to, uh, talked about for teams to kind of find that tipping point from surviving to th um really there's a whole lot of things that kind of fall into place there again um start simple like alex said and and work on getting some success and then again success breeds success from that standpoint um working in the community uh getting sponsors um and i've i found uh, the the festivals things like that 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 you can have students there doing a demo of the robot helps quite a bit um, not just to attract new students to the team, but to get manufacturers in the area, uh, people wanting to come in and um, really, really support the team. And again, knowing that, uh, that we've had the success uh, helps quite a bit. Media team, if you can have a media team that does a good job of getting uh, press releases out, um, get with radio stations. Uh, I do a lot of that, a lot of that with the, uh, with the team. Uh, we've got a really good group of kids. I've been proud, very, very proud of them. And uh, gosh, this is my 10th, 11th year, I think. So I've had three daughters through, through the program, um, a lot of success. And uh, I just, it's something that I love. And uh, you can really see that uh, in our mentors that they, uh, they really, really like working with the kids, and uh, it it all just kind of gels. Awesome, and I guess kind of also piggybacking that off, um, what's something that makes you proud to be a mentor of seventeen twenty? Oh gosh, um, seeing seeing the success that the kids have after they leave our program. Uh, seeing uh, the, all the opportunities they have with FIRST, uh, it opens up so many scholarships. And just by having FIRST on your resume, it makes that process of getting into college so much easier. Um, myself, uh, my oldest daughter uh, came onto the team and had her first year on just the animation sub team. And then the the next year really decided that she wanted to go hang out with the programmers. And she now is a software engineer, uh, graduated college last May. And uh, it helped her figure out what it is that she really, really wanted to do. And um, that success is, is immense uh, through the program. So. Awesome. Awesome, cool. Um, so, uh, it was lovely talking to you. Um, I was going to spend a little bit of time um, talking. Yeah, thanks again, Sean. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about my experiences um, and then uh, and kind of echo some of the stuff these guys have said. A lot of what I wanted to say actually was in uh, what these these two, uh, two people have said. Um, and then we'll try and leave a little bit of time open for questions. Although I should ask, is there, Chris, is there any questions from uh twitch for sean not right now but i certainly uh, have my fair share of questions as you start to um talk a little bit i'll i'll definitely chime right, in with awesome. some questions cool. yep. definitely cool. so um a couple of the things that so to give you a little bit of background on me um this is my 10th year in first um and it's my seventh year as a mentor um which is not the most common thing for a 20 year old uh, 21 year old kid to be able to say. Um, but it's something that I think um, the experience of teaching people has helped me a lot with figuring out about how, um, how teams work together. Um, and so a couple things that I wanted to echo um, 
in my experiences. Uh, and this is really something for all teams. So I know there's, I'm certain, I'm sure there's some people out there who are FLO um, mentors or FTC mentors. Um, well, we might talk about some of these things that can help um, FRC thrive. Uh, there's been a lot that's actually helped. Um, a lot of these similar core concepts are what can help FLO and FTC teams thrive. So I think I'll kind of start there in the first in the first place. Um, I did my first four years mentoring with a some local FLO teams, um, and I spent a lot of time working with the two head coaches, figuring out, hey, how do we um, how do we run the team? Um, there are two coaches that are very dedicated and awesome guys, but they hadn't had a lot of uh, first experience before. And one of the things that I found um, always was kind of the tipping point to get a kid from just eh, being there, um, doing kind of general work um, to actually getting really into it was um, finding something that they were really excited about um, and finding something that they were passionate about doing and getting them excited about that. Um, and there's, there's a lot of different ways that um, we can get students excited about this. Um, and these students can be um, if you're a mentor, your students, or if you're, if you're a student yourself, your team members, you know, how do you get other people more excited, more passionate about what you're working? Um, because um, it's kind of one of those things that um, once someone's really into it, they're going to work really, really hard in order to find a way to get better and improve over time. Um, for FLO, I found that um, getting kids excited is a lot easier because they're young kids who are having a blast doing um, a bunch of work. Um, and so often you typically just say, here's a robot, go for it. And they'll have a blast trying to find stuff out. Um, it's a little bit harder once you get a little bit older because um, some of that kind of youthful energy and excitement's died down a little bit. But I think the biggest thing that can really get um, people involved is finding projects for people um, that finding projects that when um, when you get people involved they can see the output of their um, progress very very quickly in the beginning the short term so as a programming mentor I'm always looking for ways of how can I in that first three weeks of having a student um, because it's really typically when they make the decision um, the first three weeks. And then also um, I say the winter break um, is the two milestones for keeping students um, because they're the biggest gaps you have. Um, they're the biggest times where you really need to get this or get other people involved and excited. Um, and so finding ways to show that progress and what they're doing really, really quickly. Um, FLL is awesome because uh, you can get a robot up and running really quickly and see the progress. Um, for FTC or FRC, though, you sometimes take a little bit more time. Um, so really look for activities that can show this progress quickly and get kids hands-on and working. Um, another great thing um, is to also find ways. Oh, can people still hear me? Yes. Are we good? Mike, check. Yeah. Okay, yep. cool. Awesome. Um, I got some weird interference on my side. Um, the next step, I guess, is, well, how do, where do you direct this energy from? Um, you can get, let's say, an FLO team very, very excited about the project they're working on. Uh, but if the kids, if actually this is students or mentors, don't know what direction to go um, and where to divert that energy, sometimes it can be um, wasted. And so I think the best thing is... Um, well, the two bet next best steps after you get some energy built up um, on the team and excitement is to find ways to um, learn from other resources and other teams around you and see what other people are doing to do really awesome stuff. Um, I knew, I know I as an FLO student had no idea that there are these amazing creations out there. Um, these teams that are um, constantly winning states going the world doing these amazing projects it's often because um they're they start they found a way to get to that point and then the incoming students saw what was happening and their mind was kind of almost expanded 
it's really hard to do something for the first time. Um, but once you kind of get that cycle going, you keep that going. Uh, so looking into what other teams have done um, to improve their team and figuring out what benefits they've had. Um, and then the final big thing is, um, I would say then is once you kind of have, um, once you have that general like beginning experience um, or kind of that idea of what everything's going on, um, it's then and figuring out how do you keep that knowledge continually going. And my biggest thing that I think can really benefit a team uh, to make sure that you're continuing to thrive is knowledge retention. Um, and so the best way to retain that knowledge is to actually have students teaching other students. Um, if you can have junior or for like high school team, juniors or seniors, or if it's a middle school team, eighth graders, teaching these younger students their skills. Not only does do the younger students hear some of the, like get to learn more and they kind of get this precedent set that set that I will someday be teaching as a junior or senior, but the junior and seniors innately will become better at those basic skills that they're trying to teach. Teaching is by far one of the highest levels of understanding. And so if you can get your students doing the teaching, if you can get on board with making sure that they're doing these, these things, then the next generation will build up in the cycle. And that's what I've seen after researching some of the top tier teams was this kind of cycle uh, of students teaching students and mentors are there to make sure there's not knowledge gaps and also fill in some of the almost what I call age old experience, which is stuff that has disappeared over the four years. Um, so it sounds like um, it's, so that's kind of my overall thing. Um, we've got in the chat, it says that we have a question regarding FLL. So Chris, could you let well, us know I what just, that is? Well, I, it's a couple questions from me. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. That, um, and really um, any of the three of you, Alex, Sean, Carl, feel free to um, uh, kind of chime in and answer this. Two questions from the FLL standpoint you're talking about. Um, one of the things that we see with, with FLL teams is sometimes they're really good with the bot or they're really good with presentations or they struggle with one or the other. Um, uh, and of course, lots of turnover every year in FLL, lots. Um, it's not uncommon to see a, a, an FLL number stay for years, but the name changes every year because it's, you know, it's a lot of turnover. Uh, any recommendations or any thoughts from you guys on on how uh, teachers or, or small groups that have these FLL teams um, can uh, year after year thrive? It's a it's definitely a different beast than FRC. Yeah, it, it definitely is a, a different beast. Sean, do you want uh, to start myself, talking about that? Yeah, sure. Um, myself, uh, I know running the the two teams that we have. Um, over the last three years, I've gotten to where I really like to only have fourth through seventh graders, uh, which is one advantage of being a, a community-based FRC team, is that um, we give them the opportunity, once they get to eighth grade, to working with the student and the parent, decide if they want to go ahead and move on up. Um, I like the, the FLL because it's a well-rounded program. It's got them working on the research project. Uh, they're doing the programming, they're doing the designing of the robot. And then when we move them on up to FRC, we always, with a new student their first year, don't lock them into a sub team. We want them to go around and hang out with two or three different sub teams and figure out what it is that they really kind of like. Again, they may start off thinking that they want to be a programmer and then turn around and decide no, maybe I like CAD a little bit more, or maybe I want to do photography, video, take care of the website, do social media things. Um, it's nice having that. Um, the way that we have our team set up is basically like a small company. All the different parts have to work together, but they start with that in the FLL and kind of learn some of those different areas. And then we get them to kind of explore it even more in the big team and then go from there. And we've had a lot of success with that over the, over the last several years. 
Well, that's great. That's some good advice. And and again, it's nice to hear some consistent themes. Last night we heard a little bit about uh, with the team structure. We heard uh, you got to run like a business, and uh, and and mostly from the standpoint of not you know running it like a business to to make profits. Of course, you do have to raise money, but really from the idea of, of structure. Uh, there is another question, um, probably for uh, Alex and Carl. Uh, would be when you were a student. Uh, what did you enjoy teaching your younger peers? Although I guess, Sean, that could apply to you, even though you probably didn't do first. No, I did not. <laughs> Alex, do you want to start? I'm way too old for that. <laughs> so I guess things I enjoyed teaching, um, I got really into the electrical sub team. So a little bit before I was on 4272, I was a student on team 135. So their program is a little more interesting in that they only allow juniors and seniors on their FRC team. Uh, and then they've actually expanded uh, the freshmen and sophomores are part of the FTC team. And that's a way to kind of keep their numbers down because uh, there's a lot of interest in their robotics program. And I think it actually works really well. Um, so I really enjoyed starting out in FRC, helping the FTC teams uh, just with their electrical side of things and uh, some of their programming. It was really exciting to see these students be able to get their robots moving things like that. Um, I got into some of the more mechanical stuff as uh, in FRC and I still kind of enjoy teaching that. And I did enjoy teaching that, especially as a senior to some of our junior students on how to machine things, how to build, et cetera. But yeah, uh, just a lot of different stuff. It's really fun to teach what you know to new students and kind of keep that information, keep all those skills and information in the program is really exciting. Yeah, um, for me, teaching, um, I was all about teaching programming. Uh, I was awful at it. Like, I wasn't, yeah, I was pretty awful at it because I, um, looking back at it, I actually didn't really know how to program at the time. Um, I didn't understand FRC programming basically at all. Um, but I remember as a freshman, the only one making it through. Um, and uh, this, sophomore who was right above me looking at me and being like well Carl we're the only two left and we have no programming mentors so we're going to have to design some curriculum um but I really enjoyed teaching um those kids that stuff um and I really worked like working with my FLO groups um it was it was a lot of fun to work with younger kids um who had um that fun energy and then going to competitions and having a lot of fun um with those students. So I think as a student, I really enjoyed, um, I enjoyed kind of the, uh, I would say I really enjoyed doing the, the presentation, like teaching the presentations to FLL kids um, just because it was, um, it was just something that I kind of figure out a process to do. And I see that even now with uh, programming, now that I kind of do know what I'm talking about, um, something that there's going through a process in teaching kids, I think. Uh, we've got some other questions here. Um, well, one is a, a comment in the Twitch line. Alex helped me drill a hole in steel once when I was in FTC. 10 out of 10, helpful. So <laughs> good comment there for you, Alex, uh, teaching people how yeah. to drill, drill into steel. It's always fun cutting metal with metal. Um, <clears throat> Alex, how did your mentor support structure change when you went from thriving to, th I'm sorry, from surviving to thriving? How did our mentor, so hmm, thinking about that. So we, as we kind of evolved as a team, I think this isn't super traditional, but our mentor pool changed dramatically. So I'm a, from 2017 or from 2016, I think I'm the only remaining mentor on the team. We had a complete turnover. So there were a lot of changes with that. I don't know if it was quite, uh, surviving the thriving as much as just we had a whole new group and we, we kind of changed it up. Uh, but a big thing we started doing, I think it, we started this in the uh, 2018 season, is we had a committee of students, uh, of, of our student leaders and uh, our mentor leaders uh, would actually get together uh, usually every other week during the off season uh, to kind of plan how the team would work and how we would function, uh, which I think was a big help. In addition, recently we found because we're part of PFP, we've got a lot of new mentors coming in and things that it's become really important to start doing mentor training 
I've got a lot of young mentors. Um, young mentors are great. I think college student mentors are great, uh, but it's really, they need a little bit of coaching to get in. I mean, admittedly, I don't think I was a very good mentor my first couple of years going on to the team. And it's just things I didn't know, that whole student to mentor mentality. So we've actually gotten a lot more programs in place to train mentors, kind of to be on our team, to learn how our team functions and just to how to work with students in that way. So I, I think honestly, we got structure. Once we started um, kind of tipping into uh, a better, a little more competitive team, a little more structured program. And I think that all kind of find a place if we're looking for ways to improve building that mentor structure, getting your student leadership structure together is a really key thing to thriving as a team, becoming more organized and becoming better. All right, fantastic. Um, then uh, you guys could um, maybe each of you chime in. We're, we're about five minutes left in the segment. Um, it's, so far, it's been really great. I've really loved listening to you guys talk about your experiences. Um, the, uh, how have the challenges that, you, uh, that your teams have faced changed maybe a little bit as you've now gone into thriving? Have you faced some new challenges from surviving to thriving? Um, I know from 1720, it's just always, every year is always a, a kind of a fundraising type thing, whether or not you're going to be able to, to have the funds to, to move on to the next competition. Um, we've also been very, very lucky um, that we have had quite a bit of stability in our mentors. Uh, like I said, myself, I think I've been 10, 11 years with the team. Uh, our lead mentor, Mike Cook, has been here from the inception 15 years ago. Uh, we've got a lot of other mentors who have anywhere from, you know, five plus years. And um, when we do have a new mentor come in that uh, basically they have the skill set, we just have to acclimate them to to the team structure and how how things work within the, uh, the FRC kind of world and first world. And uh, that's really the biggest challenge for them. But uh, we've been really, really lucky with having a lot of stability with mentors. Um, you, you mentioned that bringing in the mentors, uh, and that kind of leads into uh, another question. One of you guys could answer is, um, is there a tip that you might have for teaching new mentor mentors the culture of either your team or first, if they, if they didn't come out of uh, another first program or they weren't first alum? You mentioned that, Sean. Is there a tip for teaching them some of the culture of team and first to bring them on board? Uh, really is a lot of it just the uh, the structure of the team itself. Uh, something that you uh, you mentioned, uh, Chris, I think it was last night or the night before, uh, having a good uh, communication. Uh, we use Slack. We've used it uh, for probably five or six years now. And uh, just having that constant communication helps helps quite a bit. Um, that's that's uh, definitely key for a for a team. Uh, you've got to have some kind of good communication structure. So, uh, Carl or Alex, do you guys have you brought some new folks on? I know you talked, uh, Alex. You talked about some of the college mentors. Many of them coming for you guys anyway out of Purdue. Yeah. Um, in the Purdue First program, uh, many of them come with first experience. Um, having been in going very quickly from first participant to first mentor um has there been some challenges or tips that you guys have in terms of making that change with them or i mean going over it early i think is important so we kind of started noticing this as a problem probably not this previous season but the year before we noticed that some of our new student or our new mentors were coming in uh not knowing quite how we function at the same time our team was starting to develop a pretty consistent way to function. So, um, I mean, going over it early is really important. Uh, getting the mentors working with the student in the off season is really is really key. We actually have a we had a mentor meeting, uh, but I think it was November uh, that basically explained how we do things, kind of our standards as a team, and just what we're trying to push, uh, kind of some guidelines on mentoring to where we don't want to. Uh, kind of where we want our mentors to be, how we want their how we want them to kind of push ideas from the students and stuff. I think it's really important to kind of decide what how you how your team needs to um, function and then kind of push, make sure you explain that to the mentors so they kind of know what they're coming into. 
Great, but Alex, I think, uh, thank you so much. I'm sorry, Sean. I was gonna say one thing, the biggest question that we have from a lot of our new mentors is how does the competition work? And all of that <laughs> kind of works itself out. Once they get to that first competition, they love it and they're hooked. So, uh, you know, just getting getting through all of the, the build season, all of that training, and then getting to an actual competition and they can see how everything starts to starts to gel. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that closing thought, uh, Sean. And Carl, thank you so much for uh, leading this panel discussion this evening. Uh, wish all of you the best uh, with work and school and uh, all the craziness that's going on. Uh, again, thank you. And, and uh, we're going to move on now to our last session for this evening. Um, it's an interview uh, being conducted by our uh, one of our student Board of Directors, you'll recognize her. She was on earlier, uh, representing Team 8232, Devin. Um, and uh, we'll unmute you, Devin. Unmute you, Devin. <laughs> so I'm gonna introduce, so I'm gonna you, introduce you, and then I'll let you introduce, I'll let you introduce the, guest. the guest. The guest. Awesome. So this is Devin Langley, Devin with, Langley with first Team 8232. So I am very excited to introduce you to a great friend of my family's who's also very involved in the FIRST community. Um, I first met Dr. Andy Maluzzi when he was a student at Rose Holman Institute of Technology. Andy was actually a student of my dad's and it wasn't long before they discovered their shared love of Lego. Um, in his senior year, Andy decided to start a first Lego League team in my community, and he reached out to my family because he knew we'd be interested, and he was certainly right about that. Um, so FLL 100 Team Storm was born. And if you know me, you probably have heard me talk about this team a lot because it's really been such a big part of my life. Um, but okay, Andy unfortunately had the nerve to go and graduate from Rose Holman after his first season with us, um, a season in which we competed at the Purdue Regional event and at the state championship. At both events, we won the Gracious Professionalism Award. And I think that should really give you some insight as to what Andy really prioritizes about FIRST, um, the kind of values he models and um, the values he instills in the students that he works with. And even in um, the other adults, I mean, our new coaches that took over Team Storm the year after Andy graduated, um, they still taught keeping the core values um, at heart at all times because that's um, what Andy taught them first is. Um, Andy then moved to Florida to get his PhD at the University of Florida, but he is responsible for putting us on a path which would lead us on an incredible first journey. And for me, that apps, that's a journey that has absolutely no end in sight. Uh, Andy, I'm very grateful that you are willing to spend some time with us today. Um, I have no doubt that those listening in will gain an understanding of your great passion for FIRST. And I know we're all eager to learn a little bit more about what you do as an engineer also. Thanks for having me. For having I feel me. like I have a lot to live up to with that introduction. <laughs> oh, you will. I have no doubt about it. Um, but let's see. Do you want to start um, with telling us a little bit more about how you were involved in FIRST programs as a FIRST senior mentor? Yeah. So, yeah, so um, back, um, in back in 2014, I started an FRC team, FRC team. Um, which, uh, um, which, uh, um, in, um, in Gainesville, Florida, Gainesville, which is Florida, where, Florida, which is where the, the University of Florida, University of Florida is. And uh, from there, um, I, hold on, there's an echo I'm hearing. Maybe that got rid of it. There we go. Um, so I started the team uh, 5145 Wolfotics down in Gainesville. Um, and we ended up winning rookie uh, all-star. We went to championship. And it was there where I first heard about the senior mentor program. Now, during that season, because there's no exit strategy from first, um, I had been commuting to Tampa most weekends, getting up around 3.34 in the morning to drive down there so that I could judge first tech challenge events. Um, I had been volunteering in sort of the local first Lego league events, because um, Lego was sort of my gateway into first. Um, you know, and I had just, 
it had become a thing of passion. And I found out what the senior mentor program was and that it was sort of, you know, enabling me to do more of that. Um, so I got that opportunity. Um, and since, you know, that uh, following summer, um, I have been helping teams all over the state. Uh, my background is largely technical, um, you know, but I've been helping teams fundraise. I've been helping teams, you know, grow and expand, uh, bring new people into the fold. And then of course, you know, Devin, you, you talked about it, um, my, my love for gracious professionalism and that, you know, concept of core values and how we can share those across all FIRST programs. Um, so for me, that's sort of where things started. And, you know, since then I have been able to grow. We now have three other senior mentors in Florida, which is great. Um, and I've kind of gotten to mentor the other senior mentors a lot. Um, which is fun to see other people sort of going through what I went through and learning how to enable other teams, uh, which is ultimately the best part of the job is when you see teams that were struggling or that were rookies and they come back and they get an award or something, you're standing up cheering for them just as hard because you know what they went through. You were there with them. You, you got the call from the coach, like, how do I bag this robot? What do I need to fill out? What's that form? You know, um, and then you get to go from there. So like, it, it's been a great, great journey. And one that I don't see intent, uh, ending anytime soon. I love FIRST a lot. And it's just one of those things where it makes me happy. I'm living vicariously through everyone else and getting to see these uh, you know, teams grow because I didn't get to do it as a kid, um, but I'm getting to help others make it happen. Absolutely. Well, I think just like those early mornings alone, I think that kind of shows just how dedicated you are to this program. Um, so I know you said you weren't on a first team um, in school, but what kind of exposure to first did you have um, prior to starting Team Storm? And could you maybe talk about like what inspired you to start a team during your senior year of college? And I mean, I should point out to everyone that at this time you were finishing up two degrees in computer engineering and software engineering from Rose Holman. So that's kind of a really intense time to start a team. So I think we'd like to hear kind of what motivated you and what inspired you to do that? Yeah, so I didn't know anything about FIRST um, until my senior year in high school. Um, I had seen like robotics competitions and I had actually seen FIRST but didn't realize it was FIRST um, at different events. Um, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio um, and we had NASA Glenn Research Center there and they'd have open houses and they'd have their first team, you know, they're demoing and all that. And I'd seem to be like, oh, cool robots, didn't really know much about it. But the Case Western Reserve University hosted a high school Lego robotics competition each year. And they didn't host it or they weren't going to host it the one year. So they said, well, you might want to look at first as another option. And that's where I first found out what first was. Unfortunately, it was after like the deadline to register a team happened for FRC. Um, so I ended up just going to an event to check it out um, and was immediately hooked. Thought it was like the most amazing thing ever. Wish I could have done it. They ended up hosting the Lego Robotics competition that year, which my team did win. Um, so like, you know, robots have always been like a big thing for me. Uh, but that that was that first sort of like, what is first? And um, I sort of was tangentially involved, you know, for the next couple of years. Um, uh, I would, you know, volunteer at an event here or there and that sort of thing, but just sort of, you know, uh, mainly at the Lego level. Um, and it wasn't until 2009, um, I got a very cool letter in the mail from the Lego group uh, asking if I wanted to be par become part of what was known as the Mindstorms Community Partners. And uh, that group, we ended up getting to help collaborate on the EV3's creation um, and provide some community feedback uh, to Lego during that development process. And we were at World Championship, um, which was at that time still in Atlanta at the old Olympic uh, complex there. And um, one of my friends was like, oh, have you met Dean yet? As we're at one of the uh, parties. And I went, no, like I knew who he was. I knew, you know, like he's a famous inventor. He invented the Segway, you know, portable insulin pump, you know, that sort of thing. Um, no, can I meet him? And he's like, oh yeah, let me, and introduces me to Dean. And Dean asked me, you know, like, what are you doing with FIRST? And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm just sort of, he's like, well, here, make sure you, you know, and like his assistant was there and he's like, give my assistant your email out. We'll make sure you get involved. And I got a follow-up email ultimately that uh, got me uh, going from just sort of volunteering here and there and maybe tangentially helping out with the, uh, the Rose Holman uh, sponsored First Lego League team at the time um, to uh, I got asked to, you know, judge at Boilermaker Regional and got, you know, sort of suckered into then, uh, you know, judging, uh, you know, First Tech Challenge and that sort of thing. And, you know, uh, that was probably the happiest, you know, 
uh, event in my life looking back on it um, because one, I got to meet someone who was really cool, but two, like I got involved with a program um, that has done so much good and I've gotten to see others. Um, you know, I'd be remiss if like I didn't show off, like I'm repping my Team Storm shirt still. Um, I actually still have a collection of them that I wear regularly because like I love the kids and all that um, and watching you grow. And I want to point out that Devin here, like when we were, when she was young, you know, uh, and we were coaching the team, getting her to talk was like the challenge of every meeting. And now she's here like talking on stage, talking on national advocacy, leading a discussion here. Like that's why I do first. I get to see this incredible growth in people and I get to see them really grow into their element and gain that confidence. And uh, I'm really happy that that started and it started with me with Lego and that has grown ever since. And it's an amazing, amazing opportunity. Yeah, so I am I am beyond grateful that you introduced this program to my family because it's it is absolutely 100% changed my life. Um, and I'm just beyond grateful. Um, and you, you brought up like your um, work with the Lego group. Like I remember um, Andy at one point, he like built a Lego Minecraft creeper. And I remember he brought that to uh, the Lego club that Team Storm used to run at our local library and like kids are all over it. So he's done some pretty cool stuff with that also. Um, but I remember that you always had a very great love of Disney. Um, what, what kind of drew you to that company? So I grew up as a kid, I was very lucky. I got to go to Disney World a whole bunch of times. I grew up watching Disney movies. I know like every Disney song known to man, still kind of listen to them regularly um, sort of thing. And like, it, it was just a big part of who I am. I really liked uh, Disney stories for what they were, but I also really liked Walt and sort of the man behind that. Um, you know, I had naturally wanted to be an engineer since I was little. Um, in fact, I remember when I was like three years old, I was sitting there playing with some Lego blocks and my mom walks in and says, Andy, you're going to be an engineer one day. And I look at her not knowing what an engineer was and said, but mom, I don't want to drive a train, you know? So like that had been there my entire life, um, you know, and Walt Disney himself was someone who, and I still do like trains by the way. Um, but, uh, you know, he was very much into that out of the box thinking and that sort of creativity. Um, and I would go to Disney World and I would sit there and I would look up and I'd look and try and figure out like, you know, how does the ride work? How does, you know, the lighting work? How does that sort of thing happen? I had done technical theater in high school. I did some at Rose Holman. Um, I did some in the community uh, area around Cleveland. Um, so like that was a big part of who I was. And, you know, I wanted to, you know, sort of learn more. Um, and Disney was one of those companies that sort of fuses, you know, sort of art in that performance with engineering. Um, so when it came time to, you know, find a career after finishing up my PhD, um, I had gotten a great working relationship with uh, some folks from Disney uh, from, you know, first actually. Uh, and I had had great relationships and first has overlapped many times in my life. I used to uh, intern at National Instruments, for example, and at Microsoft and first has always been a common thread um, within those stories. Um, but I started looking for a job and, you know, I mentioned it to some of my friends who work at Disney and they were able to, you know, sort of, um, you know, point me in the right direction there. But also um, I had other friends that were very vocal and advocating for me to stay in Florida because um, I had several offers uh, to return. And Disney was one of those opportunities that allowed me to still be the senior mentor here in Florida and work with all those great teams, um, you know, and continue that, which has really become a passion of mine. Um, so that sort of led to a career at Disney, um, which has been a lot of fun. Uh, it's always a different challenge every day. And, you know, it's amazing to think that like, you know, some little boy from Ohio that thought engineers only drove trains is now, you know, uh, working at the most magical place on earth. And uh, yes, I've driven a monorail. That, that was a fun sort of thing that I got to do one day. So like, you know, I did get to drive a big train um, and I felt like a real engineer at that point. Well, there you go. I mean, that's like a full circle thing right there, isn't it? <laughs> um, well, it sounds like your work keeps you very busy, um, but I know you spend so much time working with teams also. So could you maybe talk about how you balance um, your work and also mentoring at the same time? Yeah, so I have sort of two jobs in a sense, right? You know, nine to five-ish is, you know, Disney. And then the other five to 9 a.m. is first. And uh, for me, it's a passion. So it doesn't really feel like work. Um, when I come home, I have 
usually a, a half dozen or more first emails that I get to look at. Um, you know, sometimes I have coaches that called me during the day um, and stuff like that that I get to follow up with. Um, I'm actively mentoring uh, a team, 5816 here in Orlando Gravy. Um, so I go to their builds um, or I go to events in the area. So, you know, managing that, it is my social life. It, it's also my anti-social life. Like my friends know that, you know, when January happens, they're not going to see me sort of until May. And then they see me for a few weeks and then June conference happens. And then they see me for a few weeks over the summer and then we start everything up in August. So, uh, but what's fun is that so many of my friends are in first and that they're all over the country. Um, I love going to championship for the reason of I get to see everyone who I either talk to during the season or the people who I haven't seen in a year um, and first has become that sort of family and that friendship for me. Um, so when, you know, it comes to that sort of balance, it's like, okay, part of it is work and, you know, fun, you know, being an engineer, but then the other part of it is, you know, uh, I get to go see my friends and family um, and do robots and nothing can beat that. And it, it's a lot of fun. Absolutely. And I, I love what you said about like meeting people like all over the country like that. That's been true for me too. like my best friend um, lives in Pennsylvania and we met each other at the Legoland FLL competition in 2015. And so it's and we get to meet up at like different international competitions. And it's just it's such a great community. Um, but so I'm sure you were very excited when you learned that, you know, your two worlds, First and Disney, were coming together for our First Rise Challenge. Can you tell us, you know, what that was like when you learned about this partnership? Yeah, when I found out, um, it was one of those where, so like, I love Star Wars. I have a very strong affection for Star Wars. Um, it, it's, it was a great story throughout my childhood. My parents are big Star Wars fans. So for me, that that overlap. And when I found out that, you know, Disney was being involved at that sort of level where they're, you know, the theme, the concept was Star Wars, um, I about lost it. Um, I remember sitting there at championship uh, with some friends uh, from work and all that. And we were just sort of waiting, knowing what was going to uh, come out and just seeing everyone's reaction and the excitement there. Um, it was so cool uh, to see everyone else sort of share in that um, and realize that like this story that largely sort of, you know, guided me in a sense towards becoming an engineer um, is getting to, you know, empower others. Um, I mean, there's so many great, you know, examples of ingenuity and creative thinking and problem solving in the Star Wars stories. And that mirrors so closely what a first season is like. Um, and it's just so cool to see those come together. So yeah, I about lost it. Um, you know, there were high fives and cheering all around because uh, it's pretty cool to see that happen. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. It sounds just like such a cool experience. Um, so I guess my next question, do you see any um, similarities between working with people professionally in your engineering world and working with your first teams? Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's funny how what you do in first is really a microcosm of the real world. Um, every you know, day, it's the same problem. You know, usually it's not enough time, not enough money, uh, and not enough expertise, but you need to make a informed decision and go down a path and sort of grow in that. Um, so I've had days where I will have that exact same problem. And then I go to the FRC team and I'm like, well, we got to figure out how we're going to climb today, guys. I don't know. I'm an electrical engineer. I'm not going to, you know, uh, my degree is in computer engineering, software engineering. I, I, but let's figure it out, you know, and you start looking, uh, you know, you get out the engineering books and you start figuring it out. Um, and it's that sort of like, hey, what ideas come to mind? Uh, there's a lot of similarities um, between that process, you know, professionally as an engineer, um, as well as that process, uh, you know, um, with a team. You know, engineering would not be very fun if everything was just plug into an equation and go. Um, you know, I was listening earlier, um, and there was uh, a person sp uh, speaking about, you know, controls engineering and sort of what they have to go through with that process and that documentation. All that. And it's the same sort of thing on a first team. Um, it's something I see in my job, you know, it, that's, you're doing new and different things. You got to, you know, sort of define what they need to do. You need to make sure you can communicate that well to others. Um, so it, it's just uh, really the same process. And then you have the same problems too. You know, you will have friends at work and you'll have some people that you don't necessarily like as much. Um, and you have to learn how to be productive and creative and, you know, ultimately solve a problem with them. Um, so, you know, I mean, I've had students that, you know, I want to pull my hair out with and I've been at work and I've had, you know, projects where I'm sitting there and like, you know, it, it 
sort of the real world. You got you got the same uh, thing going on there. So, but they both also share that joy of when you're done and you get to, you know, for us, it's opening something up and sharing it with guests for, you know, first it's that robot competing. Um, you know, you just get this immense joy as well. Of like I did it like, yeah, the path to get there was hard and I had to learn a few new things and work with some people, you know, but we did it. And, you know, even when you disagree with someone, you know, you're still sitting there giving them a high five when you're done with the project and cheering with them. And I mean, that's, that's such a big part of first. Absolutely. Well, it's the core values, right? That makes it so special. Um, so this is my full circle question. Okay. So ever since, since the beginning, you have instilled in our team how important the core values are. And so um, I want to know what your favorite core value is and in what ways do you see it being used in the work that you do every day? You know, it's funny because uh, first core values have evolved over time. Um, and at one point, gracious professionalism in and of itself was a core value. And I still very much identify with that uh, concept. But I think of the modern sort of core values. Um, I think the biggest one is, you know, the inclusion in that we're all on this team together um, and we respect each other and we embrace our differences because we can learn from that. And for me, that is a big part um, of what it means to be an engineer. Uh, it, it really is something that like I learned through first. Um, I was lucky I was brought up, um, you know, encouraging, you know, to go ask questions and to meet new people. And I went to a school where that was encouraged. And that's something that, you know, first, you know, reinforces. And it's just something that uh, really resonates with me because I realize, you know, and this is some of those things that I guess smart people never realize how smart they are. People keep telling me I'm smart. I don't agree with that necessarily because I know all the things I don't know. And for me, I love talking to others and just hearing different points of view and different ideas, especially when it's someone who is different than me. And, you know, seeing those different ideas, someone who doesn't have the same background as me, didn't have the same childhood, you know, and has a different idea because that's a different way to think of a problem. And usually those different ideas can make your solution better. And, you know, fusing them together, uh, you know, that aspect of, you know, almost teamwork, which is sort of its own core value in its own way. But, you know, that's such an important part of working together. Um, I really, really like that core value. And that really resonates with me. Yes, I, I love that. That's amazing. Um, well, those are most of my questions. I, I do have one in the chat, though. Um, people are asking about the pins that you have in the background, and like what the significance of those are. Yeah, so so those pins, um, I can move my head a little bit side to side. When I was a kid and I went to Disney World, uh, trading pins at Disney World is a thing. Um, and most of those pins are from my childhood. Um, when I started working with Disney, I uh, you know, decided to put them up on the board. But some of them um, are different special pins for different things um, you know, that we've done. So uh, they're all you know, like public. There's nothing you know, particularly you know, surprising there, but like, this pin up here was, uh, you know, given for, um, I think that was sharing time in the parks or something, you know. Uh, so th there's different little ones up there for different little stories and different little things. Or sometimes I get one to commemorate, you know, a project or going to the park with friends and stuff like that. So uh, they all sort of tell their own story. Um, but uh, yeah, that's what those pins are. Um, and it's a nice little way for me to remember every trip. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so another question from Twitch. Um, what techniques do you use to teach your students the core values? So that's probably the hardest one um, is to teach the core values. Uh, and I, I kind of disagree with the idea of teaching core values. Core values are something you have to experience. And uh, probably my favorite one that I used on Team Storm uh, your rookie year was when I put Trevor, your brother, in charge of the robot. And at the time, he was all of seven years old. And we had a 14-year-old on the team as well at the time who had to listen to a seven-year-old. Um, and that was a very interesting dynamic. Uh, there was never any friction, but it was really cool to sort of create that situation where they had to see something different and unique in each other. Um, and you know, I can tell someone you need to be nice and you need to listen to everyone, but it's a little bit easier when you can elevate someone else into that role to say, okay, you have some unique skill. Um, I want you to do it. Yes, you might be the youngest one on the team, or you might be the one with the least, you know, uh, education background, or you might be from a different area, or you know, um, and that that gives them that opportunity to really sort of grow up um, and uh, you know get to master that. And 
I maintain that our rookie year, the reason why the team was successful was because we had people taking leadership roles on that team. And there was a mutual respect for everyone because everyone knew that, you know, someone, yeah, everyone could contribute. Um, and I, I just remember that very vividly though. And I remember the nervousness in Trevor being like, are you sure you want me in charge of this robot? I'm seven years old, you know? And I remember your parents being like, are you sure you want our seven-year-old in charge of this robot? You know, but then we had great success. And, you know, I remember actually there's a great photo of you and I wish I had it. Um, occasionally your mom shares it on uh, social media um, of when you picked up, uh, you wrote the code that picked up, um, I believe that year was, oh, I'm blanking on that year. It wasn't Food Factor. It was the year after Food Factor. Um, but you picked up a tractor trailer truck and that was something that you guys had programmed right there on the site. And it was you and another uh, student on the team who just like, both hands in the air cheering and it was so cool. Um, so for me, like, you know, those sorts of things are what uh, really make it special for me and really help, you know, engage the core values and not really teach them. Yes, that's awesome. Um, I remember exactly, I remember both of those stories very distinctly. I remember how empowering it was for Trevor to have that leadership position. And, oh, there's the team the first year. <laughs> um, um, and I remember um, how much respect um, the older student Hudson um, had for Trevor. And I, that was just such a cool thing. We, we still tell that story to this day also. Um, I love how little everyone looks in there. Like it, it's such a blast from the past there seeing. Uh, and I also find it very interesting that you're wearing a Star Wars Lego shirt in that particular photo. I know, I know. Well, it had Princess Leia. So I wanted like the, the female representation, but. but. Definitely like a full circle thing there too. <laughs> Mr. Osborne, do we have any other questions from Twitch? Sorry about that. Uh, let's see, um, what limiting belief do you spend the most time working with students to overcome? I think the biggest uh, limiting factor that I've encountered and it's extremely frequent um, is the idea that I've never done this before, therefore I can't contribute. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's, you know, a five-year-old kid getting involved with First Legal League Junior, or if it is an 18-year-old who's just joining a first box competition team for the first time. You know, there's this idea that, you know, I've never done this before, I can't contribute. Um, and overcoming that, I think, is the biggest thing. Uh, I remember, Devin, when you joined First Legal League, for example, you were not really in it to build the robot. That was not where your interest was. Um, but you got a lot out of it and you contributed to the robot, you know, um, and that sort of, you know, ability to say like, yeah, none of us had really any expertise in how to solve any of those challenges, but we did, and we had fun doing it, um, because we worked together and, you know, getting that idea that your idea might not be perfect, you know, but there's no grades in this and if it doesn't work, we'll try something else. It's not the end of the world. Um, that's probably one of the most difficult things for kids to overcome because they're so used to school where they're taught, like, I must have an A, I must do this, I must do that. Um, and then to say, no, 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 it's okay that you don't know anything. We can try it. And if it doesn't work, we'll try something else and we'll grow from there. Um, and then when you see them try something and it's especially confident, you know, uh, it's especially comforting and builds my confidence, you know, as a mentor, when I see these students that come in with that attitude and then finish the season, they're like, oh yeah, of course we could do that. And you're like, six weeks ago or you know, three weeks ago, you were like, no, we can't do that at all. There's no way we can drive across the board straight. There's no way we can make our robot climb. And by the end of it, you're like, oh yeah, yeah. How far do I need to go straight? You know, here, let me, and you're just like, that, that's, that's honestly, you know, um, the, the coolest part is watching people sort of blow away that belief. Um, but that's by far my most common one that I hear. And I also hear it of mentors and teachers and coaches, um, which is not true. You don't need to be an engineer to coach a first team. You don't need to be an engineer to mentor a first team. Um, you need to be passionate and that's about all it takes and, you know, be willing to try and fail. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, and you're right. I mean, I, I definitely did not see myself building a robot. I did not see myself as a programmer, but by the end of my FLO career, I really, I loved coding. And I, I, I went on, I took a programming class in high school because I just, I ended up enjoying it that much. And so those, those transformations are definitely, definitely something that happens here. 
Um, well, is, is there anything else, Mr. Osborne, or should we go ahead and wrap up? I think oh. there's, oh, I think there's, the photo. I think there's yeah. one other thing that we needed to show. Thanks to uh, Devin's mother, who is paying close attention to this evening's call <laughs> and has a very quick uh, <laughs> access to her camera roll, apparently. And, and for some context, that's Devin's father in the background there watching. And he was one of my math teachers at the time. And let me tell you, if anyone's worried about confidence, there's nothing more terrifying than coaching a team of your professor's children, especially right after they assigned a test or homework or something. Uh, and they're knowing that you're spending like every night that week coaching their kids because they're competing that weekend and you're still doing your homework. Uh, that, that's a little terrifying when, you know, the tables flip, when they say, no, you, you coach my kids and, you know, you inspire them. Uh, it's very humbling and also a wee bit terrifying, but I was very, very lucky at Rose that I had professors that, you know, really became great friends and I still consider many of them friends and keeping close contact with them. So, uh, well, uh, what but a, it was still terrifying. Yeah. Well, what a fantastic note to finish on and a fantastic picture to finish on. Uh, we've got lots of pictures like these in first at every level. And it's, it's uh, to me, it's that, that moment of joy and excitement and, and stress. And it's that mixture of all those things uh, that brings out the, the, these amazing experiences for these young people. Uh, um, Andy, thank you so much for being on this evening and sharing us uh, your story. And, and Devin, thank you for taking the time to interview. I know I'm sure it was very painful uh, to um, spend time. It was so much fun to catch. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was so much fun to catch up. Andy has definitely left a legacy for us. And um, we're, we're very grateful that you took the time to share what you've been doing with our first family here in Indiana. And I love keeping in touch with my Indiana first family. I've long said my goal in life is to retire and teach at Rose. Um, so I've said that publicly now. So, you, you know, we need to make that happen next. But, uh, you know, I, I miss Indiana a lot. And I miss, you know, my friends and everything up there in Terre Haute. And, and you know, I mean, my goal would be is to retire and teach at Rose during the day and then coach first teams at night. And you couldn't ask for a better life than that. Well, we'd love to have you. And, uh, and I think with that, uh, thank you for everyone who participated in our virtual conference uh, this evening, our rookie teams, uh, Monica and Casey providing some, some good information on self-care during uh, this time of self-isolation. Uh, Carl for leading a great panel conversation on uh, the tipping point in teams. And uh, and we heard a little bit about tipping point tipping point in people. I think too this evening with uh, with the interview with uh, with Andy. Uh, and just uh, anyway, thanks to everyone and and Megan uh, Tobias finally as well uh, for talking to us about uh, HVAC and the engineering opportunities. There's so many different career opportunities with a with a degree in engineering. So everybody have a fantastic night. Uh, we will be back on the air next week, Thursday and Friday. You can check out our website. There'll be links to it uh, on our social media, firstindianarobotics.org. From there, you can check out our schedule. We'll be posting that, uh, the, the, the breakdown of the schedule as soon as we uh, get it here in the next couple of days. Have a great night, everybody and a good weekend.